Doctors, we are live. We can start the session. Good morning, friends. Happy New Year to all of you. On behalf of the Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association, as the president of the Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association, I have the greatest pleasure of welcoming you all for this TNOA Connect series. As you all know, the theme for this year is Tamil Nadu Smiling and TNOA Shining, and we are doing exactly that. For the past four and a half months, we have been very, very busy on the academic front, having various webinars. Close to about 22 webinars have been conducted. Apart from that, we have also had an ophthalmic photography competition, ophthalmic video league, the national quiz, the Tamil Nadu quiz, and so many other activities, the World Sight Day, the World Diabetes Day, and you can see that there is a 360 degree coverage as far as the academic activities of TNOA is concerned. I have to sincerely thank my entire team, the president-elect, vice president, the secretary, treasurer, and all other office bearers of the Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association for giving me a free hand in doing all these uh, uh, webinars. And today, we have the TNOA Connect series, and this Connect series is done in association with Rajan Ike. As you all know, this Connect series, what I have given the concept of connecting with the major institutions in Tamil Nadu. The first Connect series was in September on mucor mycosis, the RIO GOH. The second one was with uh, Shankar Nitrali on periodic ophthalmology. The third one in November was with Agarwal Eye Hospital, again on challenging cases. And the fourth one, which is a huge success as well, which is on uh, along with Eye Foundation last month on cornea and refractive surgery. I have to thank all these institutions for coming forward and sharing their expertise and knowledge, which is not only beneficial to the postgraduates, but also for the practicing ophthalmologists in general. And today we have got the Connect series and we have got a fantastic, what you call galaxy of speakers and galaxy of panelists as well. Before I introduce them, let me uh, ask our uh, president-elect, Dr. Ramakrishnan, who has been the source of inspiration for all of us from Aravind Hospital in Tinalveri, to say a few words. Uh, uh, respected uh, president and uh, uh, wonderful uh, panelists and uh, uh, skillful uh, speakers uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, video symposium on cataract, uh, challenging cataract surgery. A very warm uh, good morning to all of you. As uh, told by your uh, honorable president, you know, TNY for the past uh, more than four months is doing a wonderful uh, uh, activity, especially in the uh, so many webinars, walkie talk, and other uh, video symposium, quiz, and uh, so many things have been conducted uh, every week. It's not even uh, half our week uh, at past four months. And this today is uh, really a wonderful. Uh, Video symposium where uh, uh, Rajan Iker is uh, arranged uh, wonderful uh, uh, with wonderful speakers. I uh, can say as a top in the field of uh, cataract surgery, I am not only Tamil uh, Nadu nationally and internationally. Definitely, it will be a wonderful academic field for the uh, not only for uh, practicing ophthalmology but also for the fellows and the postgraduates. So because. Uh, so many 12 speakers are going to show their uh, uh, wonderful videos so that we can uh, learn so many things from uh, uh, this motion uh, today. This, uh, thank you very much. And I also welcome, once again, welcome all the speakers and panelists and our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Arke, sir, for always a very, very motivating um, um, uh, speech. And uh, we'll go on to our uh, dynamic secretary, Dr. Madhavan who is, I would say, the handsome hero as far as TNOA is concerned, doing so much of excellent work for the past so many years. And uh, over to Dr. Madhavan to say a few words. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, dear President, Dr. Mohan Rajan, our President-elect, Dr. R.K., sir, our managing committee members, our star-studded panelists, and of course, the galaxy of speakers, and our members who are following TNOA both in YouTube and Facebook, a good morning to you all. And we welcome our members to yet another episode of TNOI Connect series, video symposium of challenging cases in association with uh, Rajan I Care. We are indeed connecting, we are communicating, and we are consolidating in our endeavor to keep 
our TNOA shining, the motto on the uh, motto of the year de declared by our president on his installation day itself. And so we are looking forward to being enriched by today's webinar, which is powered by FOIA. And we are thankful to Numeratech also for the contribution. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Dr. Madhavan, for their nice words. And uh, we, I go on to the uh, introduction of the panelists who don't require any introduction. Dr. Ramurthy, who is, uh, I would call him the colossus of ophthalmology in India, as well as in, the, in this part of the world, I would say he is not only an ophthalmologist, he is also a chairman of the Eye Foundation. So they have 13 centers, and you know how good is a speaker, is a his knowledge on both uh, cataract and uh, the anterior segment refractive is simply simply incredible. And it's a pleasure and honor to have Dr. Ramurthy in the panel today. And of course, Dr. Panir Selvam, who is uh, really a fantastic surgeon, the chairman and medical director of Arasan Naya Hospital, a huge training center and past president of the TNOA as well. And uh, uh, Panir Selvam has got a huge knowledge and I'm sure he's uh, uh, sharing of his knowledge and expertise will uh, uh, go a long way as far as the um, uh, ophthalmologists uh, here are concerned. And of course, Dr. Ritu Arora. Ritu Arora and uh, Ajay Arora, they form a fantastic pair like Rohit Sharma and Virat Kohli. They do a huge amount of work in uh, Noida, the Vision Plus Eye Center. Uh, Ajay taking care of the posterior segment, Ritu taking care of the anterior segment. Uh, very, very highly um, uh, qualified, competent as well. And in both... Uh, anterior and posterior segment surgeries, uh, both Ajay and Ritu. It's always a pleasure to have Ritu in, the, in this uh, panel. And of course, Sujata, I would call her the magical surgeon. She can do everything um, uh, except the retina work, but uh, she does everything, cornea, cataract, glaucoma, glue dye well, and you can see, uh, she, you can see the, uh, learn, of the uh, learn the art of the, um, uh, uh, the surgery with Sujata. And she's the executive medical director of Rajan Care. And we are also honored to have Rajan Care we're partnering this uh, TNOA in this Connect series as well. And uh, uh, of course, uh, along with me is uh, our coordinator, Dr. Ravi Shankar, who has been the main guy instrumental in organizing all these webinars. Unfortunately, his father passed away, and so I think he's busy with some uh, rituals there. And uh, so he'll be joining us very soon. And we have a galaxy of uh, uh, speakers. I call them the Super Ten. The Super Ten. Uh, the uh, the all top people, the top people will be showing some various cases in cataract and eye wells, whether it's a challenging case or a simple case, but a very clear take home message. I request the speakers to confine to, uh, their uh, this thing to about five minutes, and uh, so that we can have five minutes of discussion and then go on to the next speaker as well. So with this, uh, I would like to introduce the first speaker who again does not require inter introduction. His videos do the talking, Dr. Deepak Megur, Megur Eye Center, Bidar, in North Karnataka. His videos are really something incredible to watch. Phenomenal stuff and, you know, so educative. And, you know, Deepak, uh, it's always a pleasure to have you in this uh, TNOA Connect series. I'm looking forward to a great video from Deepak. All yours, Deepak. Share your screen. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Mohan Rajan, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Team TNOA, for uh, hosting this wonderful meeting, and I'm honored to be a part of this. So I'll be speaking on uh, uh, tough capsules, and uh, it has an audio. Please let me know whether the audio is coming there. Yeah, I'll let you. Well, we've all seen yeah, these capsules. Coming. Typically, we encounter them in long-standing hypermature cataracts. The calcified capsules are challenging to manage since creating rexes becomes very difficult. They can either be cut, not torn. They are vulnerable for radial extension and during stressful manipulation, we end up causing zonular stress. From the outside, all of them look alike. But I would like to classify them into two distinct groups. Number one is a calcified capsule with a plaque. The second variant would be a fibrotic capsule. This distinction helps us to use different tools and techniques to deal with them. The first group is a classical calcified capsule and I realized that the ones belonging to this variant have an underlying calcific plaque and this is the root cause for all the problem. The subcapsule plaque is strongly adherent to the underlying capsule and this makes the capsule behave in an unpredictable manner. So what's the solution? Well, the answer is quite simple. Just get rid of the calcified plaque. 
Now, how to do this? Let us look into few cases. This is an elderly patient having hypermature long-standing cataract with calcified capsule and a close observation denotes the presence and extent of the underlying plaque. The arrow marks are highlighting the extent of the suspected plaque area. So how do we deal with the situation? My plan will always be to manage this in two stages. First create a small primary rexus. Number two is to dissect and extract out the plaque and finally create the secondary large rexus. As I'm trying to puncture the anterior capsule, one can appreciate that it is very difficult to cut and tear. And during this manipulation, I can notice enormous amount of stress induced in the zonules. Now once a tiny flap is raised, I'm using the forceps which comes in handy to create a small central mini rexus. Now is the time to deal with the underlying plaque. The plaque needs to be dissected out by cutting its attachment to the overlying anterior capsule. I am creating a cleavage plane between the anterior capsule and the plaque by using a combination of blunt and visco dissection. The part of the plaque which is central is gently peeled out with the forceps. As we can see, a ring of calcified plaque continues to remain and it's extending up to the mid periphery. Again using a forceps, the subcapsule plaque is gently teased out and being freed from the overlying anterior capsule. A combination of mechanical and visco dissection helps in separating the last few attachments of the plaque. And finally, the entire plaque could be dissected out and extracted out in total. In the absence of this plaque, the anterior capsule behaves just fine. One can notice that the second rexus is created with great ease. The nucleus is emulsified easily, well, the case essentially becomes a routine one now. The next case, a similar one, a hypermature, long-standing cataract in an elderly patient. Arrows are denoting the possible extent of the underlying capsule. The plan is very much similar. Do an initial small CCC, dissect out and remove the subcapsular plaque and then enlarge the rexus. After the initial puncture, a small rexus could be created. Again, I'm using a combination of visco and mechanical dissection to separate the plaque from the overlying anterior capsule. In this case, I'm using a flat iris spatula to break the adhesion between the plaque and the anterior capsule. With a little bit of patience and perseverance, separation of the plaque from the overlying capsule could be achieved. Part of the rexus is enlarged, the area where the anterior capsule is free from the plaque. Now I'm attempting to remove the plaque. The part of the plaque which is extended up to the periphery makes the situation slightly tricky. Pulling it is going to induce stress of the zonule, so I'm using a second instrument to provide counter traction. This helps me to extract out the plaque without damaging the zonules. Once the plaque is out, the capsule behaves just fine, as if nothing was wrong with it in the first place itself. These are the pre and post plaque removal pictures. Well, the lessons I learned was that if I can deal with the underlying subcapsular plaque, we can successfully create rexus in such cases with calcified capsule. Now moving on to the next variant, it has the fibrotic anterior capsule. With great difficulty, a puncture and a cleavage plane could be created in the anterior capsule. Now a 23G cutter is introduced under the capsule and the capsulectomy is performed using high cut rates. The technique is very simple. The cutter is held under the anterior capsule and my left hand is holding the irrigation cannula. With very little effort and stress in the zonules, we could achieve a decent sized capsulotomy in this complex case. The vitreous cutter works very well in such fibrotic capsules. The high speed cutter cuts the capsule without pulling or putting any stress on the zonules. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank Whoa. You. Whoa, I would say. What fantastic videos as usual, Deepak. Really fantastic and you have shown that the calcified capsule and uh, how uh, important it is to remove the subcapsular plaque. Now let's go on to the panelists. Dr. Ramurthy, I would like you to comment on this uh, particular uh, problem. Fantastic videos, Deepak. I mean, I always learn whenever I see your videos. <clears throat> Just some basic principles. Of course, most points have been already elucidated. I think whenever you suspect fibrosis or plaque, always stain these capsules. And sometimes it's a localized area of uh, plaque or fibrosis. And it's possible to circumvent that so that you know you start in an area where there's no fibrosis, go around it and encompass the fibrotic area within the capsule itself. And uh, in these, these are situations where I find the uh, LRCS, if it's available with you, is a great platform. 
though you may not get a free floating excess, it gives you a nice uh, <clears throat> template. And you may have to go in with a uh, utrata forceps or with a, um, a needle and then separate out the area of additions and it gives you a nice uh, um, capsular excess and the machine having created a good template. Other thing I find is that sometimes you have to use a um, combination of a <coughs> micro excess forceps and maybe a micro excess scissors with wherever, whenever you encounter the area of the fibrosis, you go in through the side port and create a small nicks in the area of the fibrosis and encompass that. And then as was shown, there are uh, some recalcitrant plaques, in which case uh, going in with a um, uh, vitrector and then uh, creating the, having made a slight nick and then enlarging it into a circular fashion also helps, gives you a certain amount of cut. And sometimes it's impossible to get a nice ground excess. The good old uh, uh, can opener capsulotomy also helps. It's better to have multiple nicks on the capsule rather than just have one or two areas of excess runoff. So if you do that and then you are able to deal with this, that again reasonably helps. In these cases, of course, I would always recommend uh, prolapsing out the nucleus into the anterior chamber and do uh, anterior chamber phagomystrication using adequate amount of dispersive scholastic. So naturally, depending upon the situation, you have to deal with it. But I think, uh, especially the very clear distinction that the Deepak brought out between uh, fibrotic plaques and uh, <clears throat> fibrotic capsules and plaques under the capsule is really a new concept. Seen this video before, but uh, always keep learning. Thanks, Ramo. I think uh, two things I want to ask you. Well, uh, when you use the LRCS platform, I also would, you use a little more energy in the offset also. What is the modification uh, you do? See, uh, basically, I have a 300 micron offset on either side that is both yeah. uh, below and above the capsule because most of the current LRCS platforms have the ability to uh, exactly center that, uh, detect the capsule. And uh, it's a contour guided capsulotomy that we use. It's really not necessary, but generally I increase it to about 400 microns because there might be a thicker fibrotic capsule. But otherwise, I don't play around with the energy or the spot settings. And here you are not really expecting a free floating capsulotomy. What you are right. really looking at is a nice round template. And then subsequently you separate the capsule along the template that has been created. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, only thing is uh, these uh, rexes don't run back like the regular ones. So uh, in one way you are safe. The uh, another concept what Ramurthy was telling, anyway, I'll go to Panir Salam before that. Bringing the nucleus, because these nucleus are usually very hard. You can see the brown cataracts. Bringing into the anterior chamber, you, know, you will have, I'm not sure whether it's a good idea. But Paneer, what's your take on that? Uh, since you are doing a lot of uh, both uh, FACO as well as SICS as well. Paneer, uh, what's yes, uh, depending on your confidence level and what type of surgery that you are planning. Um, for the youngsters, I would suggest you should be ready for SICS rather than attempting FACO, promising FACO, because this is a very difficult to uh, do the rexes. And uh, Deepak has come up with very nice taking of uh, small rexes, taking out the plaque and then going ahead. And also the fibrotic capsule, how uh, he handles. So uh, my take is you should be ready for it. If necessary, you should be able to convert it to a can opener and take out the nucleus out of the back. For the SICS? Yes. <laughs> okay. Ritu, what's your take on that? Ritu, what's your? Where is Ritu? Yes. Please unmute. Unmute. I think it's very important to have a good pre-operative examination of such patients and make your plan beforehand. At the same time, one should be comfortable both with, uh, you know, forceps as well as with cystitome and have all the, you know, like the micro scissors and uh, forceps available. So you should have the proper armamentarium. Moreover, many of these uh, uh, lenses have milky fluid. So uh, having a proper uh, good uh, viscoelastic is very important, uh, I think, uh, to make sure that you clear up the milky fluid when you are uh, doing the capsular excess. So of course, uh, using uh, tripan blue is uh, inevitable. And I agree with Dr. Ramurthy when he says, you know, when you plan ahead, when you see the fibrotic uh, plaque, if you know which area it is in, you can easily go around it and go into the healthy uh, uh, capsule. So if you plan your rex as well, uh, these cases can be uh, easily managed with FACO. But at the same time, one has to under promise to the patient 
and uh, you know there's always a chance uh, for conversion to SICS. Yeah, I think it's a good message and uh, Sujata. <laughs> but before going to Sujata, I want to ask Deepak. You said I will use a high cutting grade because these are very fibrotic capsules. Okay, when you want to cut the iris or anything which is a little thick, I always use a lower cutting grade. Yeah. Do you use uh, the idea grade? of using, uh, if you are using a brand new cutter, which is very sharp, you can as well cut with a slightly higher uh, cut rate as well. The idea of using higher cut rate is, you know, when you, if you use a lower cut rate, you can cut well because the grip is gooder. But the problem is sometimes you end up pulling or tugging at him. Sometimes when you tug, it just splits wide open. So that's the reason why. First, you try with a high cut rate. If it doesn't, then obviously you have to reduce the cut rate. So if more thicker it is, the newer cutter is better. I mean, still it doesn't work, then reduce the cut rate. It's fine. Yeah, Pujata, you, any other way uh, you would have managed this uh, fed capsules? I think I agree with all the points uh, Dr. Ramuthi said because I try to avoid the area of the nexus and then go all round. And the last bit, the one is small extension, then you can just use a vitreous cutter to cut the area. But the concept what uh, Deepak showed was really very unique and very nice. And one point I beg to differ with Dr. Pani Salvam is I think these cases are better handled with FACO than with SICS because sometimes the nucleus can be very large and be very difficult to move them outside. So personally, I feel uh, it will be safer to do uh, 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 FACO because like Mohan said, these rexes do not extend as much as we think it will because they are very uh, thick. The capsules are very thick. The chances of extension is quite uh, remote. And, um, and uh, some of these cataracts are already soft and partially absorbed because they're uh, long-standing cataracts and they can be just brought out and anti chamber FACO can be done. But uh, doing SICS, I think, uh, can be a little bit tricky, particularly if you have a very small vexus. Anyway, there, we've got uh, many ways to skin the cat. Uh, Sri, Sri, you want to say something? I think I think you should also look at the other options like uh, Zepto and uh, RF uh, uh, capsulotomy because these may work better than the femto. Mm. Uh, the femto energy is not adequate to cut the cataract. Like R Dr. Ramurthy said, it may just kind of give you a template uh, on which to work, but uh, the Zepto and the RF may actually be able to cut it uh, through because the energy is much higher. So those are also things that uh, can be looked at. But of course, wonderful uh, video, uh, Dr. Deepak, and I should compliment you on the technique of doing the subcapsular uh, fibrotic dissection. I think that that principle that most, uh, that you can remove this uh, subcapsular fibrosis and then proceed with uh, getting a good rexis is something that uh, uh, is fantastic. Yeah, Deepak, uh, one last word and then we go on to the next speaker. From you. Uh, yes, sir. I think the, uh, as uh, Dr. Sri sir was telling, Using a Zepto or an RF pottery, it helps us to create a smaller initial rexis. Then you can go and dissect out the plaque. That is where even using a, to create a small initial rexis, these devices can be more helpful rather than uh, doing a full the full size rexis. So for first three millimeter rexis can be done with the Zepto, go ahead and dissect out all the plaque and then enlarge the second rexis manually. That should be the that should work. Zepo, well. the size Zepo is fixed size. Fixed size. Uh, Zepo Zepo is five millimeter. I mean, RF pottery or RF pottery. RF pottery. Okay, okay. Anyway, you can use a combination of things. You can use a pottery. You can use a vitreous scissors. You can use a vitreous cutter. So many ways, but uh, make sure that at the end, the result at the end of the <laughs> this thing is uh, good for all of us. And what else? You can also use uh, punchorexes. Punchorexes. Yes, punchorexes. You can use that. <laughs> Works wonderfully well. I forgot to tell that. In fact, puncture axis works in all three types of cataracts. Whether it's intermittent cataract or the mature cataract, the hypermature cataract, puncture axis beautifully it does. And uh, you just create a punch and there, you know, right in the fibrotic area, you can create a punch. Just uh, one clarification, uh, Mohan. I mean, when I said that prolapse the nucleus into the anterior chamber and do a AC FACO, that's mm -hmm. only in cases where you're not able to get an intact rexis. We have either a can opener or a rexus runoff. In those cases, instead of staining the capsular bag, you prolapse it out. But otherwise, if you have an, uh, are able to get an intact rexus, uh, as was pointed out, it's always a good idea to most do most of the manoeuvres in the bag. Yeah, yeah. point well taken, Ramuthi. Th thanks a lot. And we go on to the next speaker, who is uh, actually not only a national star, but an international star. 
and uh, if uh, some other planet is also there and he will be a star there also and uh, sri ganesh who is a very very innovative lateral thinking more importantly very humble guy a great friend of uh, mine and uh, no fantastic guy every uh, uh, now and then he comes out with new innovations and uh, uh, he is uh, not only a good cataract surgeon very fast surgeon very competent is also a good refractive surgeon also one of the authorities on smile and uh, uh, sri ganesh over to you thanks a lot sri ganesh Th for joining us thank you so much mon for that introduction and uh, good morning dear friends um i'll just share my screen i would at the outset like to thank mohan and uh, uh, tna for inviting me to this webinar okay so yeah before uh, we start um, i would like to give a small introduction to this case this was a 60 year old uh, lady Uh, who came uh, with blurring of vision in both eyes and uh, she gives history of uh, recurrent attacks of angle closure uh, since one year she has also undergone uh, yag iridectomies and this is how she presented uh, and um, this is a case of nan ophthalmos because we did the axial length was uh, 16.5 mm oh. and as you can see the ac is very shallow it's a small eye uh, there is posterior synecae a dense cataract Uh, and uh, so we will look at what are the precautions to be taken pre-op and in-op in doing such a case because uh, there's a high risk. One is that the chamber is very shallow, difficult to work in the small chamber. There's a very high risk of choroidal effusion, which will make the surgery complicated. And third is uh, post-op, you have a high risk of malignant glaucoma. So all these have to be taken care of. Pre-op, uh, we started the patient on atropine ointment twice a day for three days. and uh, gave iv mannitol uh, pre op and uh, let me just show you how i proceeded under local anesthesia we were able to operate this case uh, the first thing before you start you will have to do uh, i do a prophylactic uh, sclerostomy here so I reflect the conjunctiva um, 7 mm away from the limbus and then i use a diamond blade uh, to make a sclerostomy there sri if possible yes, can you move the slider away yeah uh, so yeah. this is so this is the sclerostomy which i am making you can see that the sclera extremely thick in these nanophthalmos cases the sclera is extremely thick very carefully you will have to proceed and then i use a desme sponge this is much safer to make the sclerostomy and with a desme sponge i am making the sclerostomy okay so this will take care of any choroidal effusion you can make one or two sclerostomy so you have a nice sclerostomy there and then i just enter with the side port and uh, put in a co uh, cohesive viscoelastic to deepen the chamber and then i use my uh, dialer uh, cholester dialer to do a synecho lysis and then i free the uh, pupil and then i'm making a 2. 8 mm incision and this is a trapezoid incision because the biometry you should use either a hoffer q or a um, barrett's formula and the biometry showed a uh, iol requirement of 48.5 diopters so we had to get a custom iol made here i'm using the maligan ring to expand the pupil after the synecho lysis so the chamber is very shallow you have to be careful and then um, insert the ring you can see that uh, the nucleus also is quite dense Uh, adequate exposure is uh, important and also this prevents the iris from prolapsing because the, the here there's a very high risk of iris prolapse in the shallow chamber and especially if you have a upthrust because of any choroidal effusion then i proceed with the capsular excess because of uh, the recurrent angle closure attacks and uh, iridectomies the zonules are little weak so i'm using a capsular excess forceps it's very difficult to use the needle to do the excess so here i'm using a forceps you can see pigmentation also is there on the anterior capsule i complete the um, rexis uh, this is about uh, 4.5 mm and then i do a very gentle hydro dissection always see that the chamber is uh, maintained with viscoelastic another side port then i go in with uh, phaco i do a direct phaco chop i'm using the centurion here you may have to lower your parameters the flow rate because the chamber stability again will not be very good in such cases because you have a very shallow anterior chamber 
Uh, of course, the ozil helps uh, to emulsify these dense cataracts. And um, here I've used viscote uh, for protecting the endothelium while doing the FACO. And uh, that's the removal of the last fragment. You should be very careful when you're removing the last fragment uh, to see that the you don't create a PCR because the you can see that the PC is coming up. The chamber is not very stable in these very shallow enter chambers. So then I do the uh, cortical cleanup with uh, coaxial IA and you can see that uh, the capsular excess is intact, but the bag is quite big and uh, weak. So I just put in viscoelastic, open the bag, support it. This is the IUL. It's a customized IUL 48.5 diopters and uh, we are able to inject it through the 2.8 mm incision. And once I put in the IUL, uh, into the capsular bag, I find that uh, the rexis uh, is not large enough. So I'm doing a secondary capsular rexis because there is a high risk of capsular phimosis in these large bags. Uh, and they also have some weak zonules. So definitely you need to uh, do a secondary rexis so that uh, you have an adequate capsulotomy. After that, uh, the malignant ring is removed gently. And then I go with the vitrector. There's already an iridectomy, but I enlarge the iridectomy and I do a zonulectomy and hyaloidectomy. This is very important. I'm going deep there. I do a zonulectomy and hyaloidectomy, and this prevents the uh, risk of malignant glaucoma postoperative. So I wash that, and then I'm able to close it. If if you the iris is prolapsing, you may have to use a suture, but in this case, it was quite stable, and uh, that's the end of the surgery. I close the uh, conjunctive or the sclerostomy. So that is how I did this case. Thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, she, I think you have This patient did quite well. In fact, uh, post op, yeah. she had an uncorrected vision of 612. Very and uh, these cases are very difficult to manage, the nanophthalmos cases. So you have to uh, be extremely careful. And the, both the pre op and the uh, intra op precautions have to be taken. Yeah, uh, Sri, I think you have uh, covered all the points as far as nanophthalmos, the preoperative evaluation, and the sclerostomy. You have done the punch sclerostomy, and also uh, making sure. Only thing is, uh, 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 you didn't use uh, trypan blue. It is almost uh, very dense cataract. Uh, number one, number two is uh, one of the main uh, problems in nanophthalmos is that you don't want the chamber to shallow especially when you are removing the instrument outside the eye. So I didn't see you, especially the first time. Second time when you are doing IA, I saw you. In yeah. the so that's why I said always, I, in fact, I mentioned that the chamber always has to be maintained. You have to keep injecting viscoelastic when you are removing the instrument. Yeah. Uh, Mon, you have given me only five minutes sir, to edit the video. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice, uh, Sri. And uh, over to uh, uh, Ramoti for his uh, comments. Uh, superb, Sri. Nothing less was expected of you. Uh, just a couple of comments. I know this uh, concept of doing a sclerostomy used to be from the days of ECC, larger incisions. Nowadays, with more controlled 2.2, 2.4 millimeter incision, many think there was even a concept that you make, measure the sclerochoroidal complex thickness. And if it is more than 1.7 millimeters, you create a sclerostomy. Otherwise, there is no need to do it. But by and large, I've also discussed about this with some of my colleagues, and it is uh, felt that uh, with the current uh, FACO emulsification, uh, this may not be needed. And even if it has to be done, it is generally said that this should be done. The original method was about a week earlier, so that you know the chances of uh, coronal effusion is much less and that's countered. But I think by and large, it has been given up. Something else that I would do, especially if the pressure was also raised in a, such a small life, would be to do a small pass plena or plus like a uh, vitrectomy, just removing just a very little amount of uh, vitreous also, or even just ma making a incision, allowing the uh, little bit of vitreous to flow out, uh, gives you so much more space and makes the uh, surgery more controlled. Another thing I always do in these cases is to, uh, of course, we are, as you said, we always do it on a variable bar block and give a su sufficient amount of uh, occupressure the good old technique which I've almost given up mm -hmm. since we do most of the surgeries and the topical, along with IV mannitol or glycerol, I think giving a good pressure uh, on the eye also helps quite significantly. 
And uh, again, in these nanophthalmic eyes, I'm always wary of the accuracy of this intraocular lens power calculation formula. Of course, I also resort to the Barrett Hoffer Q, but often you find that they give up different values. So my take on this is uh, more than going for customized lenses. When I have extreme powers, go ahead and implant a 40 doctor good uh, single piece hydrophobic acrylic lens. And then depending upon the residual, go ahead and put a piggyback lens. And uh, that would get, allow you to, even if it's necessary, you can use a toric piggyback if there is a, uh, that allows you to hit the refractive target more accurately. Otherwise, you know, uh, sometimes it's uh, always dicey whether these, uh, even the latest of formula work accurately in these situations. Now, Great video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, before, yeah, see, it. I just want to know or ask you uh, two things, uh, Ramurthy and Sri Ganesh, because you're talking about uh, past plana going through the past. And the problem is in nanophthalmus, you do not know where the past plana yeah, is. Past. That's, That's the biggest problem. No, because I, it's only 16 millimeter. It can, I, be, oh, it can be one millimeter, it can be two millimeter, it can be three millimeter. I'm not, I'm not sure. Going through the past plana, you'll be going actually through the retina. No, if you, know, if you, you a good idea. Number one. Number two is, I want to say, uh, ask you, piggyback lens, I, I'm not for piggyback lens because for two reasons. One is the space is not there. Second thing, is opening not. this eye again is again a very dangerous thing to do. Prashikanit, what's your take on this? Yeah, uh, again, parse plana in a normal eye, you know where it is, but in an anophthalmic eye, again, it is very tricky. You can go through the retina, it can cause a retinal detachment. That's the reason uh, why I avoid this. Of course, in cases where the IOP is quite high, AC shallow, normal axial length, then you can do that technique of just making a, a parse plana port and then doing a limited vitrectomy so that you get a deeper chamber. But in this case, uh, pre-op, uh, we had given atropin. Again, giving atropin is important because these cases, again, you have a high incidence of malignant glaucoma because of the rotation of the ciliary body. That can be avoided if you give atropin pre-op and mannitol block and massage was given. You should not attempt to do these cases under topical anesthesia. I like to do a sclerostomy and a lot of them do a sclerostomy because this is like a safety valve. You never know when the IOP can go up. There's a very high risk of choroidal effusion. You saw that the, the sclera and the choroid is quite thick um, and a 60-year-old lady, a little bit of hypertension, definitely the risk of choroidal effusion is there. So it's like a safety procedure which is there uh, because during the during the surgery if the IOP goes up because of uh, high uh, choroidal effusion and you have a shallowing of the AC then it becomes very difficult to manage it's difficult to do the sclerostomy at that time um, and um, it becomes a mess so I like to do a prophylactic uh, sclerostomy and uh, regarding the piggyback uh, lens again to be avoided because the chamber is very shallow in this case, there was so much of uh, uveitis, posterior sinicae, again, putting a lens there in the sulcus, again, opening the eye, you again have a risk of uh, effusion there. So uh, that's the reason why uh, I selected. Uh, of course, we also do ray tracing. So we look at uh, in short eyes, we do ray, ray tracing, Hoffa Q and Barrett, and then kind of decide on the IOL. We tell the patient also, we are not doing re refractive surgery here. You saw the cataract. Right. It was so dense. The patient had just counting fingers. And if she has 6 12 one corrected vision, even with one diopter either side, either way, uh, it's still accepted. And they can wear glasses. So we are not looking at a refractive cataract surgery here, but we want to get as close as possible. And so doing a piggyback, again, I think is an overkill. Uh, I'm yeah. not really convinced about that. Yes, uh, she. Uh, uh, I think uh, six twelve vision is pretty good, and uh, we'll come back to Ramurthy. I want uh, Paneer. You ask two questions. I mean, I think uh, you know I should give my take on this. Yes. <laughs> no, I think I mean all very valid points, and that's just a different way of thinking. As I mentioned even earlier, it's either pass plana or pass plica uh, anti vitrectomy. Usually, we do it at three point five millimeters. In these cases, I would make my incision at two point five millimeters. Yes, it is a little dicey. And I thought the inflammation in this case was more because of the angle closure glaucoma attacks that Sri mentioned about, and it was really not a case of uveitis. And as regards the space for uh, intraoc piggyback lens in these small eyes, I think we need to realize though the eye as such is small, all these lenses are quite big. They are almost four to 4.5 millimeters in their anterior posterior uh, um, dimension. 
and uh, the intraocular lenses that we put in are more in the range of about 1 to 1.5 millimeters. So there is more than enough space for once you take out the natural lens, there's more than enough space for implanting the intraocular lens, uh, two lenses, and uh, the refractive accuracy is better. Of course, I know that many people have implanted even 60, 65 doctors. It's not getting the lens made. They come with a lot of spherical abrasion in them. And uh, determining what exactly is the power is a difficult choice. Yeah. Uh, uh, before we go to Paneer, what is the inject? Because I have done a 60 diopter in nanophthalmos and I was using uh, uh, the Alcon A injector and it broke a couple of times and third time I was able to put it. And uh, what injector were you, were you using? This was a butterfly uh, cartridge. The, uh, the cartridge and injector was supplied by the company. Uh, I got this lens made by Iocare. Iocare only. Because yeah. they, Iocare only. And it's a hydrophilic lens. So the hydrophilic lenses compress more than the hydrophobic. The hydrophobic, if you have a very thick lens, uh, then it becomes difficult. Like the Alcon lens, then you need to have a larger incision. But the hydrophilic no, lens... Alcon lens. Iocare only I used. Iocare only. The Alcon injector, yeah. Okay, um, so I use their own injector. The, what I do is I make a, it's 2.8, but as you saw, I make a trapezoid inject, uh, uh, incision so that it kind of uh, expands and it's easier for the lens to kind of uh, in, be inserted. Yeah, Paneer, your uh, take on this? Oh, no, uh, very excellent surgery done by Dr. Shri Ganesh and we learned Thank a lot. And the precaution that he has taken and the preparation that he has done for the surgery is really a learning point for all of us. I have not done a sclerostomy, which is a good point. Uh, overall, it's a great learning. I appreciate Dr. Sri Ganesh for that. Thank you. Yeah, nanophthalmos is always a double-edged weapon. You have to be careful. And uh, getting a good uh, 612 vision is really fantastic. Ritu, your, good, uh, your take on this, uh, um, uh, what's your experience in nanophthalmos? It's a very challenging case, I think, on many fronts. And uh, Dr. Sri Ganesh has done a fabulous job. Just a few things I would like to, uh, you know, ask him is why he preferred a malugan ring because such a shallow AC. Why not a B hex ring uh, in such cases? And secondly, uh, using the soft shell technique, I think, is extremely important in uh, such uh, patients with shallow AC. Uh, one more thing was like he was said uh, angle closure glaucoma. So was there any need for doing a trap? Uh, what were the pressures like? Uh, that was the other thing I wanted to ask him. Yeah, uh, the pressures uh, were controlled um, because this patient had recurrent angle closure attack. The pressure when she came to us, the IOP was uh, normal. It was not very high, but she had had uh, iridectomies also. Yeah, iridectomies. Uh, and uh, regarding the um, yeah, soft shell technique. I used uh, uh, coercive viscoelastic, um, sodium hyaluronate, uh, and uh, capsular exchange was that, done with the uh, with the forceps. Uh, regarding the rings, of course, you uh, pupil expansion rings. You can use the BX ring also, but I feel the BX ring is a little um, uh, fragile and a little. Yeah. Flimsy. So yeah, so it it moves uh, also when you're doing the the procedure. With the malignant ring, uh, though it is a thicker profile, uh, it is more stable. It's more stable and the movement is less. And uh, here I had a 2.8 mm incision. If I wanted to insert the ring through a 1 mm incision, then probably the BX ring uh, would uh, be good. But um, here I use the malignant ring. Good. Very good. Sujata, a quick uh, one or two words. Uh, excellent uh, demonstration of Posterior sclerostomy, uh, and the entire surgery has been done so well. I think pre-op preparation and everything is, uh, like you said, that it is the right way to go. The only thing is, um, you know, I was doing posterior sclerostomy for all these patients. Then I discussed with my retina colleagues and they, they feel it's of no use. They say, don't, don't do anything. If at all you come across a patient with choroidal refusion, you just finish the place and quickly close down, we'll take care of it. Because they're saying that uh, doing it preoperatively, uh, it really does not help. So um, I think people who are doing the routine vitrectomies should be the right people to comment on this. So I have stopped doing uh, the routine uh, posterior sclerotomy, which is doing in anophthalmus cases. Uh, Nibir, yeah, I, want, I want to do, do a B scan yeah, yeah. and find out the thickness of the sclera and the choroid I uh, think, uh, before the surgery. Yes, sir. As you said, I think it depends on the case. Like what Sri Ganesh showed end to end, it was a brilliant thing. 
so we have done both the methods ma'am so on one method doing a sclerostomy has definitely worked and it is proven studies are there that uh, it reduces the chance and risk of choroidal effusion but now also in some cases where the ac was very very shallow we have also done the troca technique that ramamurthy sir said and we have tested videos that just go 2 mm or 2.5 mm from the limbus and a little bit of vitrectomy just deep enough to just shallow it so that also prevents this choroidal effusion so i think uh, both the techniques work uh, very well in these types of cases but my, my question is sir is it necessary to do a sclerostomy in all cases because sometimes we just prepare it and keep it so in case there is a sudden shallowing or sudden tightening and whether at that time we can do the sclerostomy i think uh, if we take uh, follow all the protocols very strictly from end to end like what she gane showed uh, by preventing the shallowing of the chamber and taking care of the parameters and uh, i think it will be a good uh, 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 result at the end uh, i think there I is know. there is no large volume studies um, uh, comparing uh, with sclerostomy without sclerostomy Uh, because this is just opinions which say okay it helps some say it doesn't help i have done both i have done uh, done both but again uh, i feel it's a prophylactic step and uh, if it's there it suppose you have a choroidal effusion or even like an expulsive sometimes uh, if having that um, kind of helps because you can at least complete your surgery yes. otherwise you will have to stop in between suture you cannot put the iul in it becomes more uh, messy Yeah, uh, so having taking it, it just takes a a couple of uh, minutes more to do it. But then, uh, if it's going to help reduce uh, up thrust and re- uh, make your surgery more comfortable, then why not? I had a very bad experience. One of the uh, the uh, patients, an ophthalmus. One eye went on very well. He had six twelve vision like this. The other eye, you know, all of a sudden the irrigation the stopped. because the bottle was over they didn't notice that and the the ac shallow and after that there was a up thrust okay and uh, i was not able to put a lens and left him a fake kick and then post operatively developed a choroidal effusion choroidal hemorrhage as well he had to do a vitrectomy and settle the uh, thing and he did uh, is doing well even a fake here now though there is a rim i don't want to go inside again and i um, just given him contact lenses anyway these are the uh, various uh, challenges we face in anophthalmos we go on to the next speaker dr sujata who doesn't again re- require any introduction she is the main pillar of rajanai care and she'll be showing us uh, some very interesting cases as well thanks shri and uh, i would like you to stay on for some more time we don't mind yes more thank you <laughs> um at the outset i'd like to thank uh, tamil nadu ophthalmic association for giving me this opportunity so i'm going to talk to you about a couple of cases uh, where we uh, i did the triple procedure <coughs> so the first case was a 60 year old female patient who had undergone phaco emulsification had a nucleus drop on the table and was managed by pastina vitrectomy and nucleus removal she was le- left a phaco and developed corneal decompensation and she was referred for management <coughs> so the the plan was uh, in this patient was to do a glued iul uh, uh, followed by um, uh, um, a dsec and because she had a very large uh, dilated pupil on presentation uh, the plan was also to combine it with the pupilloplasty <coughs> so the first step in this was to prepare the eye for receiving the uh, glued iul so i'm here i'm doing a vertical fixation and uh, two um, uh, flaps are made the 180 degrees apart after doing a conventional peritomy a sclerotomy is made uh, on either side underneath the flap and multiple sclerotomies are uh, multiple corneal entries are made into the anterior chamber and anterior chamber maintainer is used and using an mst forceps and a multi piece uh, intraocular lens is injected and exteriorized on one side and using the handshake technique the other haptic is also exteriorized <clears throat> and a sleeve of pockets are made uh, into which the uh, the haptic is stuck and once the stage of the procedure is over the next stage would be to uh, go in for the uh, endothelial keratoplasty and here um, before we do the endothelial keratoplasty because the pupil was large an sft was planned here you can see that a uh, uh, 10 0 polypropylene needle is used and it is docked uh, to a, a 26 gauge needle <clears throat> through the two arms of the iris 
And once it is done, a, a loop of the uh, uh, tensile polypropylene is pulled out on one side. The, uh, that side of the suture is trimmed and passed four times through the loop. The idea is to create a knot which is strong enough and that doesn't go away without having to go in several times. So that's the advantage of this uh, single pass uh, pupiloplasty. And once this is tied on both sides, pulled on both sides, the knot is tied. And this, uh, by using a vitrectomy uh, cut, uh, scissors, you can just cut off the knot. So the same thing is done on the uh, other side as well. And uh, using a 26 gauge needle and a tensile or polypropylene, uh, it's railroaded into the uh, 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 tensile uh, into the 26 gauge needle. The loop is pulled out. And the same procedure is repeated on this side as well. <clears throat> so the advantage is that you get a very nice, neat, uh, round pupil. So that ad management, uh, particularly in endothelial keratoplasty, such as BSEC, which is very important, can be managed. Otherwise, the air tends to escape and goes to go to the posterior chamber, which can result in uh, uh, <coughs> poor addition of the graft. So the next step is to remove the uh, endothelium. And this can be done either uh, using a, a saline or for best visualization, you can inject air. Once you inject air, you'll be able to see the uh, uh, endothelium much better when you're, when you're stripping it. And uh, in, in case of DSEC, uh, it's, uh, you can get away without even stripping the uh, endothelium, but if you're planning a DMEC, you have to do it. And here I've enlarged the incision slightly and I'm using a uh, push in, uh, technique. Push the disc inside, injected air. And just tap the disc a little bit and center it. Just a single suture has been applied and now glue is applied uh, under the flap as well as in the peritone <clears throat> and the procedure is completed. On both sides. <clears throat> so this is the end of the case. The next case also is a patient who had um, um, a similar uh, uh, case who had a, a dislocated eye wall. 58 year old male was referred for aphakic bullous keratopathy. He had history of chroma with dislocated eye well, which is removed by ECCE. He also had trabeculectomy done in a very large and dilated pupil. So again, in this case also, we need to do a blue pupiloplasty. You can see that uh, the, uh, the cornea is quite uh, bad. The visualization is quite bad in this patient. <coughs> and um, again, the first step is, uh, would be to do a blue eye well. And this, some, some of these eyes, in spite of keeping them quiet for a long time, still they tend to bleed much more than what you would expect because of low-grade inflammation which is going on, in a, particularly in a, a compromised cornea. And uh, a sclerotomy is made under the flap. And you, uh, the lens uh, is again injected uh, through the... Um, <coughs> DC maintainer is uh, placed. A multi-piece uh, lens is injected. So in this case, the visualization was a little bit bad. And it, it's difficult to see the uh, the tip of the uh, uh, haptic. And using the handshake technique, the other uh, haptic is also uh, retrieved and it's tucked into the shadow's pockets. So the, it's almost a very similar case. Only thing in this uh, case, we just needed to suture one end of the uh, iris and we didn't have to uh, we didn't have to suture the other side because there's the uh, one portion of the iris was only was traumatized the other uh, portion of the iris the pupil was working very well <clears throat> and using an MST forceps the iris is pulled to, to facilitate uh, entry of the 26 gauge needle as well as a, a tensile of polypropylene which is uh, loaded onto the 26 gauge uh, uh, needle and <clears throat> and an SFT is done. So once it is uh, tied, then you can uh, go ahead with the, the next step of doing the uh, DSEC. So the uh, endothelium is removed under air. These eyes are extremely soft and sometimes it becomes very difficult to, uh, uh, to manage. This post-operative air management becomes very difficult. Particularly, this patient will also have a trap done and uh, sometimes a, a late post-op dislocation of the disc can happen. And this uh, uh, disc was extremely uh, thin. So a push-through technique was done. 
That was my usual uh, technique. An air is injected. And because I is very soft, uh, sometimes it's difficult to center the uh, graft. And so you might have to use a reverse Sinsky to uh, center the graft and uh, the procedure. And you need to do a complete air fill and make sure that the, uh, 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 the air remains in the anterior chamber. Otherwise, the chance of dislocation is there. And then the uh, glue is used to uh, stick the, both the, uh, <coughs> the flap, sterile flap, as well as the conventor. And the case uh, is completed. So this is a, a post-operative picture of the patient, uh, two weeks post-op. So uh, a single pass four through pupilloplasty is a very simple procedure and it's particularly useful in traumatized iris and can be done with simple instrumentation. And it's particularly useful when you do a combined procedure, uh, when you do uh, multiple procedures and you need to do, uh, have good air control, such as an endothelial pupilloplasty. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sujata, for the... Uh... Wonderful insight into DSEC, uh, glued eye oil, and SFT. You covered uh, all the points, and you also given, I think, a very important point is that to make the pupil small before you put the DSEC because it uh, acts as a good tamponade. The iris needs, especially in large pupils, you cannot obviously put an iris claw lenses. So, Ramurthy, I want your uh, opinion how differently you would have done these cases. Oh, excellent videos. I think this is the aftermath of all the heart attack videos that you show. One? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I mean, fantastic, uh, Sujata. Uh, I couldn't have done anything better. Just one small tip is that, you know, uh, I saw you passing that uh, 26 gauge needle directly through the iris tissue. Initially, I have done that and I burnt my fingers in a few cases where there's a uncontrolled enlargement. So usually, I hold the flap of the iris with the uh, uh, micro uh, forceps and pass the 26 gauge needle through the, uh, the needle of the suture through that and keep the 26 gauge needle outside. That way I find that the amount of trauma to the iris tissue is much less and you get, get a much more controlled opening. And since- uh, 30 gauge needle also, Ramati. Now I'm using- 30 gauge. 30 gauge needle also can be used. Right, this right. Uh, just tagged on to it and uh, what you're saying is absolutely right sometimes you can have a very large tear in the eye just to and it. I always find that you know having a micro uh, forceps inside to hold the flap of the iris gives you a much better control and exact positioning of the, where we pass the needle inside and uh, the only other question I have to you is that you know if you are on the table if you are shifting from uh, uh, not that uh, refractive accuracy is a concern in these uh, uh, bad cases but is there an adjustment in the intraocular lens power that you do from the basic calculation? Again, DSEC also has an impact on the uh, power calculation. Just for the uh, information of everyone, uh, would you like to comment on that? I'd like to go uh, see a little bit more, uh, uh, more my, into minus. I'd go for a minus 0.5 more. So myopic, make it more myopic. Because glue diamond per se does not cause much of refractive change. But uh, if you're doing a DSEC combined with it, you'll have to make it 0.5 diopter uh, more. So if it is the planning a 20.5 lens, you put a 21 diopter lens. So you just, uh, I can, you can even go minus one because it's better to have the patient myopic than hyperopic. But normally the the rule of the thumb is 0.5 diopters for a DSEC graft. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, so that, uh, why you went vertical on the first case? Yeah. The, when do you choose vertical, when do you choose horizontal? So when the overall uh, horizontal versus the vertical diameter, horizontal diameter is more than 12, then it's better to do a vertical fixation. But most often now we have shifted to vertical fixation because the uh, the diameter vertically is much less and you get a larger area for the uh, iris to be, for the haptic to be tucked in. And it's much, uh, easier, much more easier. That is one point. The second point is some of these patients have had SICS and already the there's quite a lot of damage to the superior uh, portion of the conventiva. So that's also one of the reasons why I prefer a vertical uh, fixation. Yeah, uh, we'll go on to Paneer. Paneer, what's your choice when you have a very badly damaged eye like this with a large pupil? Um, uh, what is the choice of secondary eye oil? You do a glued eye oil or a scleral fixated or something yeah, else? Uh, scleral fixation. We are not done any glued eye oil. Most of the cases, the iris is intact, very good. We go for iris cloth. Yes. Sir. It scleral fixation. Yeah. Scleral fixation with the uh, uh, 9 proline, sir? 
Yes, yes. Nine or probably need to. Okay. Uh, the long term results are good with your, with that. And B second. And of course B second. Yeah, that's a different thing. Sri, what you do? I know you do a lot of Yamane techniques. Yeah. Yeah, you can do Yamane, or uh, now I do the uh, four flange technique. Uh, mm. Now I have my own lens, also foldable lens for uh, the four flange. Uh, technique and uh, 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 one thing I would probably like to do is of course like Sujata said uh, aim for about uh, minus 1 or 1.5 adapters myopia and while doing the SFT do a pinhole pupiloplasty when you do a pinhole pupiloplasty then uh, uh, even if your biometry is not accurate or if there is some amount of irregular astigmatism uh, you can still have good uh, vision uh, because of the extended uh, depth of field and uh, even with a little bit of myopia, it acts uh, uh, like your uh, camera. So you can yeah. have a smaller uh, size. So probably aim for like a two millimeter pupil. And uh, otherwise... Uh, I hope you remember the zero, zero micron pupil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw your... <laughs> But I, like Ramurthy was uh, saying, I think these are all cases, your cases that she's managing. So the wife has to manage all the problems of the husband. <laughs> anyway, Ritu, what's your take on this? <laughs> uh. I think uh, Dr. Sujata has done an amazing job and uh, all the cases she's shown uh, have been managed extremely well, very skillfully. Uh, no comments. She's done a superb job on it. Thank you. Thank you, Ritu. Thank you very much, uh, Sujata. I think... Uh, sir, uh, with your permission, can I ask a question, sir? A small doubt. Or I think yes, sir. yes, yes. Uh, sir, uh, for one case, I tried to do Yamane with the existing cautery and I found that the haptic only kinked. I was not able to get that bulb, sir. Is the cautery any different from the routine cautery, sir? You cannot use your bipolar cautery. You have not to use a cautery. thermal cautery. Bipolar cautery, if you use, you cannot. It will not cauterize. You get, get thermal cauteries. You can get it on Amazon also now. Uh, the other one, which the medical one, which is there, is quite expensive. So you get um, uh, what are called thread burners on Amazon, and you can use this, and this works uh, wonderfully well. And that's what I use. Oh, the, even the metal ball cautery will do the job. The only thing is, you have to be sure that you. Yeah, you can even the, heat a squint, squint hook or a. Keep it away point. from the tip. I mean, it should uh, not touch the tip. That is. is yeah, it's extremely important. And as far as the, it's just the heat which is uh, going out of this thing and there's no direct contact, generally you get it well. And as we mentioned, these uh, cotteries now are available fairly cheaply and we can invest on that. One quick thing about this pinhole pupiloplasty, I think I would like to reserve it for extremely aberrated corneas where the quality of vision is likely to be very low. But just for getting a refractive outcome because the amount of light, the field of vision, etc. is very much minimized, maybe I would just restrict myself to making the pupil smaller of a more manageable size like what Sujata showed because posterior segment examination also, in these cases, the subsequent postoperative period is important when you had a complicated cataract surgery. So making the pupil extremely small, uh, maybe not really necessary just for a refractive outcome. Yeah, I think it's a very good point Ramurthy has mentioned because please understand that these uh, patients who are uh, having an eventful surgery, complicated surgery, and having a um, uh, drop diver, a corneal decompensation, glue diver, and all that, you need to examine the posterior segment on a regular basis, especially the periphery of the retina. You need to make sure. So I think uh, uh, probably uh, PPP is a good idea, but probably in the extreme cases, you can go ahead. So we go on to the next speaker. Thanks a lot, uh, Sujata and uh, for all the panelists for the wonderful discussion. Uh, we um, The next speaker again is, uh, I would say the, what you call the young, vibrant uh, guy in Indian ophthalmology today. And Atik, uh, uh, genes cannot go wrong. His father is also a very, very uh, busy practitioner. They have a fantastic uh, clinic in, in Chennai. And uh, Atik is also a very good uh, cataract surgeon, trained by none other than Arul. And uh, Atik is also the chairman of the scientific committee for the Madras Icon Conference, which was a huge success. Atik, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for giving me uh, this amazing and wonderful opportunity in this uh, elite pan panel of uh, great uh, speakers. So uh, I'm here to present a case. This was a 68-year-old paraplegic lady 
who presented to us with the corneal opacity, mature cataract, and a small uh, pupil. Uh, she said that uh, she's not been seeing in that eye since childhood, and uh, she was not aware what happened to her eye. The only thing she said was she was not seeing, and uh, she was paraplegic. So uh, the, uh, the issues we had were the preoperative challenges that we faced were one was with the biometry. We were not able to get the proper keratometry values. And topo also, we were not able to get reliable values. We had difficulty with the patient's fixation. So we took keratometry from the other eye. The in the intraoperative challenges that we faced were mainly with regards to visualization. So uh, the options available for uh, FACO in such cases are combining keratoplasty with the cataract. However, in this case, the pupillary area was reasonably clear. It was kind of a nebular opacity and uh, the leucomatous opacity was infrotemporal. Endoelimination, again, won't work in these cases because the cataract is extremely hard. So we decided to go ahead with the FACO. Because the uh, opacity was infronasal, we decided to do a temporal FACO. In this case, the anterior capsule was stained with trepan blue for better visualization. And uh, we decided to use iris hooks so the first hook, second hook, and four hooks were placed. And we should be very cautious not to traumatize the anterior capsule while uh, placing the hooks. Be very gentle. And pulling the hooks too far also, we should be cautious. And here again, the infronasal hook, we just put it just slightly away from the area of the opacity so that we were able to visualize it. So getting this hook was a little tough because visualization was a little uh, difficult. But then with some struggle, I was able to manage and get the hook. So this is a temporal FACO. I'm more comfortable with the three-plane incision. So three-plane incision is made. So Rexis, I started with the area where visibility was reasonably good. I was able to do the Rexis reasonably comfortably for about four to five clock hours. And then when I went under the opacity, Rexis became a little difficult. So I came out injected high molecular weight viscoelastic and continued with the Utrata forceps. This was kind of blind. But then after another three to four clock hours of Rexis, I was able to see the flap much better. And with repeated grasping and doing it a little slowly, I was able to complete my Rexis. And then again, injected viscoelastic, went ahead with the FACO. Technique. Whichever technique the surgeon is comfortable is what is best for the surgeon. So I'm doing a stop and chop in this patient. So the first groove is made. And we need to be cautious not to go with very high flow and vacuum. I'm operating with slightly lower parameters because the bag in these cases may not be very strong. There can be associated zonular weakness also. So I'm clearing off the cortical matter and uh, I'm able to get a good crack. The first crack is made. Repeated debulking of the nucleus is done. Trying to stay as much as superior as possible with the probe and not moving inferiorly. So repeated filling of the anterior chamber with viscote to protect the corneal endothelium is done. So everything is done slowly. Time is uh, 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 spared and ensured that the patient gets good vision. So again, going in, and removing the nucleus. Repeated small, small chopping is done. Debulking of the nucleus is done. And with slightly low aspiration flow rate and vacuum, the case is completed. Last piece removal, again, we lowered the flow rate and vacuum even slower, even lower, so that I don't end up with a posterior capsule rupture because that is something which will be very difficult to handle with these compromised corneas. So trying to move the nucleus into the area where visualization is better. Now I'm able to get a reasonably good glow. So that was the end of surgery. You implanted a single piece lens into the capsular bag. And removing of the hooks again has to be done with caution. We need to gently pull the stopper a little up, push the hook in front and then pull it out. So pull the stopper behind, push it in front, and then remove it behind. This was hardly a week uh, back. In fact, the surgery was done last week. 
post operatively of course the patient had some amount of corneal edema she was uh, having about uh, 636 vision with some decement uh, 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 folds and long term follow up we'll have to uh, observe and watch the patient uh, thank you so much sir for very this wonderful good. opportunity very good i think i think a uh, wonderful video i think you have uh, uh, shown that it's a hard cataract and in the presence of a corneal opacity only thing is what is the illumination you are using in the microscope whether you are using a retro illumination or a or a regular illumination uh, sir i have a, a 1fr pro with this uh, uh, i'm not getting that name i i just i just purchased it uh, about 6 months back sir pro glow pro omni glow omni glow omni glow omni glow omni glow is like you have the retro no yes sir yes sir the very very good red glow you'll get yes sir this so was omni glow that only for that yes sir yes sir okay and uh, you didn't use any indoor illuminator no sir okay. because it was a mature cataract i felt we'll not be able to get a glow even then the even then because the indoor illuminator gives uh, the light on the on the anterior capsule okay, and uh, it works uh, wonderfully well some okay. people even put sh chandelier into okay. the anterior chamber you know you have seen mypal's video put it in the past plan as well and uh, ramurthy uh, your take on this ramurthy a oh, very nice uh, video i think i mean uh, the one thing is <coughs> this was a localized corneal opacity and central area was reasonably clear i have used endo illuminators uh, chandelier illumination maybe in this case it was not uh, needed anyway uh, during the initial phases you are going to be using only direct uh, illumination and uh, later on uh, you had a fairly good retro illumination with whatever microscope and attachments that you are having and uh, one thing is you said that you used the uh, parameters from the other eye and especially since you mentioned also that the patient was having poor vision right from a young age it's also possible that there is a considerable amount of anisometropia and amblyopia so in these cases though the corneal parameters may not be you may not be able to get a good measurement because of corneal opacity it's a good idea to have a look at the axial length in case there is a large difference between the axial length and the two eyes it might even be a good idea to leave these patients uh, a fake it initially and then do a refraction and a week later slip in the lens to get a better refractive outcome and as regards the corneal opacity itself uh, you are lucky that it was peripheral and most part it was not hampering the surgery it was not very clear whether it was a adherent leukoma or just a leukoma if it is an adherent leukoma one tip is to uh, the uh, the hook that you imply that you put in has to be a little away from the area of the leukoma and uh, i think that's what you did and i always go with a, a sub incisional uh, iris hook also and as often discussed this keeps the iris from coming into the way of your phaco probe during the rest of the maneuvers and uh, i think otherwise maybe i would have used a lot of dispersive elas viscoelastics which you, i think you would have done so i didn't see it maybe that was edited out for the protection of the cornea otherwise uh, everything was well done I think point I was able to do an ultrasound uh, immersion biometry sir the axial length actually was not much different between nice keratometry i used from the other eye sir absolutely absolutely that's it exactly what i did good decision and uh, for post operatively getting 636 for this patient uh, is i think no 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 i don't see why maybe is the initial corneal is central yeah, yeah. cornea unless it's amblyopic i mean i'm sure the oh, yeah. has a greater potential for vision definitely definitely i think all points are well taken paneer uh, your take on this paneer how different yeah. when this side biometry is difficult is always better to compare with the other eye and then axial length measurements uh, when you compare it is it gives you a uh, broader picture of where to go and otherwise i think it's managed very well uh, good surgery congratulations to you yeah thank I you i think uh, he has uh, underlined the importance of uh, introducing now and then viscoat uh he was mentioning that atik and it's a very good point because you make sure that the cornea is well protected during surgery and you have done exactly that and uh, ritu your uh, inputs on this how so, uh, in, i would say yeah, in all cases where you are dealing with a corneal opacity i think pre op planning again i cannot uh, uh, emphasize it more that you should plan your incision site so that all your chopping maneuvers are in the area which is clear and away from the site of the corneal opacity secondly i would say using a manual keratometer at times does give us a you know a fairly reasonable keratometry which we may not get with other procedures so although we are not using manual keratometer so much i think it's worthwhile using it for such cases 
and um, I think excellently managed. I would also use five iris hooks rather than four. And uh, again, um, uh, using a lot of uh, good viscoelastic to protect the endothelium is uh, very important in such cases. So, uh, I think he did exactly that, Ritu, because uh, uh, of course he used only four, but he had the incision because the opacity was infronasal. And I agree with Dr. Away. Ramurthy, it looked like an adherent leukoma. There was some pigmentation. So in such cases, I would prefer to release the adherent leukoma prior to putting the iris hooks. No, I don't think there was adherent leukoma. Uh, it was pigmented, but the iris was flat, sir. Maybe an injury or something which caused it, I'm not uh, sure, sir. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it is an adherent leukoma because if it was adherent leukoma, probably would have released it during the surgery. Only thing is, when, wherever you release the adherent leukoma, that area, that iris becomes very fragile. So you have to be very careful in putting an iris hook in that area because the iris can tear in that area. So just uh, your quick uh, comments on this. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Ramuthi has covered everything as, uh, as usual. <coughs> Excellent surgery and um, I think the points to be taken are uh, use iris hooks, uh, use retro elimination, stain the capsule and uh, go to all lengths to make sure that your surgery is completed without any uh, eventuality. One more point that we have to look at is because a patient could have had an injury, the possibility that the patient will, could be having weak zonules is also a possibility. That also has to be kept in mind. So you have to plan ahead and keep a CTR or a Sioni ring in place. You may not be able to see it preoperatively because the pupils were smaller. So on the table, you should not get any surprise. That's the only thing I would add. I think we should can have... I a, can I make a point more? Yes, yes, please. Oh, we keep talking about use of dispersive viscoelastic, which is very relevant. But uh, just for the sake of any youngsters who have tuned in, uh, the only time you nowadays you get a corneal burn is when you go in with a phaco probe uh, uh, with the, in an eye filled with a dispersive viscoelastic. You know, because these the dispersive viscoelastic are thermogenic. So what we do is to basically where you want the dispersive viscoelastic is coating the corneal endothelium. So what we do is something like a modify soft shell technique where we uh, place the dispersive viscoelastic then inject HPMC in the center right in front of the posterior in front of the anterior capsule so basically most of your phaco action is happening with the in the uh, area of uh, um, HPMC while the dispersive is used for coating the corneal endothelium so there have been instances when I started initially with the dispersive elastic without evacuating the visco if you go ahead and uh, start the phaco then you can end up with a bad wound burn. Absolutely. I think I fully endorse 200% on Ramurthy. We have had, we have burnt our fingers. Only thing is when you have a viscoat, especially when you overfill the glue with viscoat, go in and aspirate that viscoat before okay. you give the phaco power. Otherwise, you can end up in a very bad corneal burn. And you know, having a corneal burn is like adding fuel to the flame because very difficult to close it. Sometimes multiple sutures, sometimes we have to put glue. So many things are there. So, uh, Ramesh, you would like to say something, Ramesh? Ramesh? Ramesh is not there. Is there? Uh, uh, okay. um, uh, um, Mohan, yes, if you, if you wish. So, uh, yes. Ramuthi used the word thermogenic. I don't think it's actually thermogenic per se, but when you don't have flow to cool the phaco probe, then it gets heated up. So, what we have to do is those are using uh, uh, and, and dispersive, both methyl cellulose as well as, as uh, this coat are both uh, dispersive. So you just have to clear a central zone where you have uh, an area where the PSS or RL or whatever fluid you're using can flow. So that should be okay. And oh, I, soft shell is sold to us. I don't think all of us need to use soft shell. You do need to have a dispersive for the cornea and you need to have a central zone where the BSS flows and then pools the tip. So Very the point, point I was making, Ramesh, was that I understand both are dispersive. But usually you don't get this uh, uh, what uh, thermal burn with the chamber is filled with HPMC. Yeah. It usually happens when you have it with a chondroitin sulfate, uh, um, uh, viscoelastic having chondroitin sulfate. So what I, I'm not, you know, I don't want to spend so much. I don't want to use Helon plus visco or anything. Actually, I use a Indian dispersity viscoelastic, which also works quite well. And what I do is to give a, um, pool of HPMC right in front of my lens. And I find that I know that both are basically dispersive viscoelastic, but in these situations, I find that uh, the thermal burn is uh, generally not there. No, the important message, uh, Ramurti Ramesh, is that I think go in 
uh, aspirate a little amount of uh, viscose or uh, HPMC and then try to give your before you give your fake power. So energy, I think that will prevent the corneal burn. Anyway, it's a very nice uh, video. I think uh, good uh, take home messages. Thanks for the wonderful inputs. And uh, you, uh, we go on to the next speaker. And uh, next speaker again is, is an international star. And uh, uh, her, uh, she is not only beautiful, her videos are also very beautiful. And there's none other than Dr. Anaga Erur from uh, Bombay. Very, very busy surgeon. Got her own eye hospital and uh, a family full of doctors. And she's also the member of the uh, uh, Academic and Research Committee of AIOS for the West Zone and very, very active academically and very good speaker. Over to Anaga. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, Anaga. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you, TNOA, for giving me an opportunity to present my case. I'll be just starting the video. Yes. Is the sound uh, audible? Yes, yes. The sound on the video is not there. It's not. Uh, yeah, yeah, you uh, need to talk then. Uh, yeah, I'll, yeah, that's why I just wanted to confirm. Yeah. yeah. So this was, I'll just stop this because I can hear that sound. On... Yeah. We are not able to hear the sound. Yeah, okay. Okay. So this is a patient uh, with a very severely uh, subluxated uh, lens, colobiblatus lens in a pediatric case. So this was a 11 year old boy who presented to us with complaints of diminished vision in the left eye since early childhood. Now this was the other eye, the right eye was six by six with just a refraction of plus 0.25 diopter sphere at plus 0.25 diopter cylinder at 65 degrees. And there was a very mild subluxation, just less than one clock hour with a dot posterior subcapsular cataract. So this was the right eye. What we are showing today is the left eye, which was 6 by 36 partial and had a refractive error of minus 5.75 diopter sphere and minus 11.5 diopter cylinder at 85 degrees. And here you can see there is a very gross subluxation nasally with the lens coloboma and the posterior subcapsular cataract. The biometry showed a IOL power of 23.5 diopters. And if you see the keratometric readings, it was just around 42.4 and 44.17. So basically, the manifest astigmatism was basically lenticular in origin. So then we went on to, and there were no other systemic abnormalities associated with the subluxation. So we took up the patient for uh, uh, surgery under local with sedation. And uh, nasally, uh, we did a perectomy and a phonics based conjunctival flap and a partial thickness scleral flap. Uh, nasally. Then we took two uh, side ports for the irrigation aspiration and two side ports for the capsular hose. Since uh, the anterior capsular was very elastic, it was very, very critical to have a perfect capsular uh, dexis. So a high molecular weight uh, viscoelastic was injected to uh, flatten the anterior capsule, deepen the chamber. There was no vitreous uh, in the anterior chamber. So using our 26 gauge bent uh, needle, the cystitome, we completed the rexis. And then we put in two olive tipped uh, capsular hooks to hold the um, capsular uh, bag that was released. Very, very gentle hydro dissection was performed. And uh, because it was a very, very soft uh, uh, nuclear material, we went ahead with the bimanual irrigation and aspiration of the lens aspiration and the cortical cleanup also. It was very, very important to maintain uh, the anterior chamber so, and to prevent any fluctuations in the anterior uh, chamber. We again inflated the anterior chamber with viscoelastic and we took uh, a Sioni's ring. It was first threaded with a um, 90 double-ended uh, suture and the Sioni's ring was then implanted into the capsular bag very, very gently. And it was, uh, the eyelet was rotated to bring it nasally, which was the point of the highest uh, subluxation. The two capsular hooks were then uh, gently removed. 
and the anterior chamber was again deepened with a high molecular weight viscoelastic. A bend 26 gauge needle was then introduced through the under the triangular scleral flap and he railroaded the uh, straight needle of the 90 proline suture through the main incision. And it was brought out from under the triangular scleral flap. It also used a Hoffman's pocket here. The same procedure was then done with the other end of the uh, 90 proline suture. And the two ends of the suture were then tied and approximated the capsular back to the ciliary surface. Here we used a multi-piece uh, hydrophobic acrylic uh, lens and it was implanted into the capsular. It was then centered well. We used a pilocapin to uh, constrict the pupil and the main incision was sutured with a single tensile ethylon suture the tip of the triangular uh, scleral flap as well as the peritone were then conjunctival flap were then sutured. Patient did very well post op Vision improved to 6 by 18 and with just a residual refractive error of minus 0.75 diopters at 180 degrees. However, the vision was suboptimal probably due to amblyopia. So there is still scope for an anterior segment surgeon to remove a severely subluxated lens through the anterior road. And this would prevent and reduce the risk of a posterior segment complication. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful, Anaga. I think it is a typical copybook style video, I would say, how to manage a subluxated cataract. What is the age of the patient, Anaga? 11 year old, sir. 11 year old and you were able to do under local anesthesia. Yes, sir. That's great. And also, why you didn't use a helmet segment instead of a Sioni ring? Sir, I thought it would help because 360 degree also it would help. Plus, we could suture the eyelet of the Sionis. Yeah. So, I prefer to use this. I thought the subluxation was quite a lot. So, along with the helmet segment, we would probably have to use a CTR anyways. So, instead of putting two, uh, I thought I would use only one Sioni ring. Okay. Um, second thing is I wanted to know because your capsular excess initially was a little small and a little decentered. Why you didn't uh, enlarge the capsular excess end of surgery? So, I purposely because... made it a little small so that I have a good margin. So, when I'm put, pulling the Sionis, you know, I didn't want it to cut through. So and Later on, I thought it was good enough and I didn't want to uh, extend it. Yeah, normally, you know, normally when you do a subluxated cataract, when you do a capsular, initially it's uh, off the center. But once you implant the lens, then you know that it's uh, decentered. Then you try to center the rexis. So we'll go from this side. Sujata's uh, comment on this first and then. Uh, <laughs> I think um, it's a wonderfully managed uh, case. And the only question is uh, because the patient, what was uh, the other eye status, uh, Anaga? Also had the other eye was six by six, madam, and uh, there was just a very mild subluxation of less than one clock hour okay. and a dot uh, posterior subcapsular. Don't you, don't you think this type of congenital problems is a chance? It's, it's a progressive disease, and uh, over a period of time, these lenses can uh, subluxate. So, uh, in a pediatric patient, I mean, I would have personally would have preferred to do a lensectomy and either do a Yamani or a glued eye veil. That would have been my choice because. Though it is a doable procedure, I've done a wonderful job of the entire procedure. It's really come out very well. The possibility of zonular uh, dehiscence extending because of the probably the uh, innate nature of the disease is a, a, a over the long term, there's a possibility that can happen. The other thing is like Mohan said, I probably the only thing I would have done extra is to enlarge the rexis a little bit more because in younger patients, the chances of capsular phimosis is uh, much more. But other than that, I think you've handled the case so beautifully and very elegantly. Now, Sujata has opened up a Pandora's box because there are many schools of thought to retain the bag and uh, another school of thought not to retain the bag, remove the bag entirely. In fact, if you ask Amar, just take it off and put a glue devil, you'll say. Ritu, what's your take on this? How would you have managed? You would have retained the bag or has it do, done something differently? No, I think uh, in such a case, uh, um, uh, retaining the bag is good uh, and uh, the way Dr. Anaga has managed it is excellently well done. Probably I would have put a CTR and then put a segment uh, and done it that way. 
but uh, i think with the amount of uh, subluxation she had and seeing the other eye where the uh, subluxation is very less i think this is uh, uh, pretty well managed i don't think i would have uh, removed the lens and done a lensectomy and uh, gone for glue dye at this stage okay. i think it's a good technique uh, sioni think and uh, paneer selvam what's your uh, how differently you would have managed this sir? but i have not done a sioni thing but she has demonstrated it very well yeah i would have put a cpr and then proceeded that i would allow to keep the back intact rather than remove it entirely uh calculating the iol power and getting the correct power is a challenge in these cases we have to take our chance otherwise she has done a wonderful job yeah. no sir this um, subluxation is more than uh, 5 to uh, almost uh, 180 degree if you notice yes. and a, a simple cpr a ctr wouldn't have been uh, okay won't uh, suffice for this so you need to fix that uh, either with the sioni or the hamad ramurthy your take on this ramurthy i think uh, superb video and excellent results whatever 618 mission more because of amblyopia rather than any surgical thing but uh, just a few things i might have done differently this is what i might have done 3 or 4 years back but what i might do now is that uh, you know especially in these situations with a well dilated pupil as you also mentioned getting the decentered rex is extremely important mm. the rex should be centered not on the uh, uh, pupil but on the capsular back and in these cases if you have access to an elasius platform then getting a uh, positioning the rex accurately is a great way to go of course anega managed to get a reasonably good rex even in this situation and she made something like a a uh, scleral flap uh, like what we do for trabeclectomy that's how i started out with and nowadays most people talk about a half pen pocket i myself have tried it but not been very comfortable all i do is to just make a scleral groove you know even in that you can just yeah. simply bury it and that's much less dissection and it works out quite well and the uh, other point is that uh, you know i think uh, you also made this point definitely uh, simple ctr will not be enough because it's a zonulopathy progressive zonulopathy and the rest of the zonules are also likely to give way but instead of using the sionis ring is what we were using earlier now i go ahead and place an amet segment and fix the bag onto the uh, sclera and then that would give uh, anterior posterior support and fix the bag right now and for circumferential support slip in a, a conventional endocapsular ring that way i find that the surgery is more controlled nowadays we use much less of sionis ring and more of a combination of amet segment and uh, uh, endo conventional endocapsular ring and using the capsular hooks in the initial period is a great idea some people i find that they use the iris hooks and the capsular hooks interchangeably but in a situation like this using the capsular hook hook is extremely important and as far as the positioning of the lens is concerned a three piece lens which has a more rigid haptics is the right way to go more better than a single piece lens but nowadays we are more switching on to uh, doing a, uh, placing the haptics in the sulcus and creating an optic capture and especially if you have a well centered rexus uh, it's possible and that's supposed to stabilize the back much better and we find the uh, long standing results are good and as far as the biometry is concerned really don't we don't have to do anything if you are doing it this way because the lens is anyway in the back that's fine can i ask a question yeah uh, what would be the advantage of using a I'm a segment with a CTR vis-a-vis -vis using one Sioni's ring. You are right, Anaga. I mean, you know, this uh, Sioni's ring can even come with double supports and all that. You can even uh, support a larger area of the uh, capsule of bag. In your case, of course, it was uh, this was quite adequate. But uh, technically, what I find is, you know, rather than sometimes the exact the eyelet of the Sioni's ring is not in line with the area of maximum subluxation. You have to rotate it around, etc. and uh, here what we do is to uh, go ahead and placement of a hamet segment technically is much easier than handling a endocapsular ring i mean with a sioni ring so you place the fix the back and then put slip in a endocapsular ring which makes it very easy uh, yes i mean the ultimate results might be the same but what i find is that uh, uh, this is more doable absolutely i think um, all the points have been well discussed and ramurthy also mentioned that you don't have to take a scleral flap you just make a groove there and go to <coughs> the groove and bury the uh, the uh, suture are not uh, in, inside the crevices of the groove and, and just uh, one point is that you know uh, though it was extremely controlled surgery in these areas where the 
which is face is exposed, it's always a good idea to place a large blob of dispersive viscoelastic uh, before you start with the rest of the procedure. But because that sort of tamponas the anti raise vitreous phase and uh, makes the surgery more controlled. So one point that I have uh, against again being a pediatric uh, age group, you're putting a, um, a tensile of polypropylene, which has got over a period of time, you know, can actually uh, give way, can dis <coughs> disintegrate. So again, you are going to weaken the bag. So my uh, take would still be on removing the, doing a lensectomy, removing the uh, lens in total and uh, putting a, um, um, uh, putting a glued eye veil or whatever. Otherwise, you know, if you want to have a very stable uh, bag, then you should use a gothic suture, which will not disintegrate over a period of time. Because if it's, if it's an adult case, a traumatic case, 40, 50 years old, it's okay to go for uh, tensile polypropylene. But the child, the, it's a pediatric case, so the chance of uh, suture disintegration is always there over a period of time. I think yeah. very valid points, Sujata. I mean, I think Gotex is the better way to go than in a 90 polypropylene. And my tolerance for removing these lenses is also quite less. But in a situation like what Anaga showed, where except for the area of zonal deficiency, the rest of the area seem to be reasonably good. If you have a good endocapsular ring in the back and yeah. you have a three-piece lens, even if in case it uh, subluxates later in life, it's possible to refixate that uh, lens with the lens back complex. And uh, maybe at that point of time, it's not doable. You can replace the lens. But uh, to the extent possible, if you are not disturbing the anterior vitreous phase and uh, uh, keeping the surgery just in the anterior segment, that might be an advantage in what she has done. Yeah, Ramesh, uh, answering your question, who's supplying Gortex in Tamil? I think we're getting the Gortex from. Uh, uh, where do you get the Gortex from, Sujata? No, you unmute yourself. Before the lockdown, yeah, from uh, the guy who deals with the, his name is Nilesh. I think he got, I got Nilesh, it. Nilesh, yeah, Nilesh. He's the one, uh, the my escape guy, no, 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 no. he's on his own, he's, he's on, his, on own. his own, okay, okay. Anyway, um, uh, Gotex is available, so you can use that because we see a lot of uh, suture degradation, uh, even um, uh, the little older people, 2008, 7, 8, uh, we have done surgeries and the patients are coming with the dislocated eye wells, and <laughs> one, uh, uh, haptic in the in the in the sulcus and other haptic is uh, in the uh, vitreous cavity. So we have to remove all these lenses and put blue dye wells as well. But anyway, there are two schools of thought, many ways to skin the cat, and we have done it. And we go on to the next speaker, who again doesn't require any introduction. Dr. George Baco is a is a, a fantastic uh, anterior segment surgeon from Toronto, very very good friend of ours, always available for our. Uh, um, AOS conferences on any conference for the IARSA meetings as well. Very, very good speaker. Done, done a lot of work on glistenings in IOL. He is uh, uh, associate professor in the McMaster University in Toronto. And uh, unfortunately, he will not be joining because of the odd timings in Canada. And uh, uh, he has uh, uh, given a, a beautiful video. I request uh, Sai or Manju to um, switch on this video, please. Play the video, please. Sai, uh, Manju? Yeah. With the audio. Is it audible? Yes. No, audio is not audible. Switch on the audio also, please. I would like to thank the Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association and especially my good friend Mohan Rajan for inviting me to uh, present this case. I would like to present the case of a traumatic cataract due to a, a projectile injury. The patient is a 15-year-old male who presented three months following the injury to his right eye. The mechanism of the injury was that he was standing close to his father was mowing the lawn and a stone was thrown by the lawn mower towards his right eye. He presented with a white cataract, the intraocular pressure was 15, and the B scan showed that the retina was flat. Examination prior to surgery revealed the following. He had a white cataract. Since this had formed fairly recently after his injury, the assumption was that there was a capsule rent, either anterior or posterior. 
there is evidence of fibrosis superiorly. Posterior synechiae abounded. Uh, there is traumatic madriasis with an atonic pupil and a suspected area of inferior zonular dialysis. The white cataract is our main concern as there is some suspected capsular rent causing this. Initially, we start introducing vision blue into the eye, but quickly realize that uh, this may be a mistake as a suspected inferior zonular dialysis would allow the, well, the vision blue to go into the vitreous cavity and affect our visualization later in the case. So viscoelastic is used to blockade that area, vision blue is then reintroduced to stain the capsule, and then viscoelastic is used to um, expel the vision blue from the anterior chamber. The viscoelastic is used to tamponade the anterior capsule and, its con and the contents of the capsule while we create our capsulorexis. Um, a lot of fibrosis on the surface of the anterior capsule makes this capsulorexis somewhat difficult but manageable uh, if we go slowly and use the capsulorexis forceps. Having created the capsulorexis, we introduce our phaco tip and quickly remove the liquefied contents. Uh, we are always weary that there may be a capsular rent and vitreous present, but luckily this is not the case. We then remove the remaining cortex using our IA and confirm that there is no capsular rent present. Our next step will be to introduce the viscoelastic and the IOL into the bag. A three-piece IOL is chosen prior to the case as this would allow us the most flexibility allowing us to not only place the lens into the bag, but also uh, allow us the luxury of placing it into the sulcus or fixating it either to the sclera or iris if um, complications deemed that this was necessary. Having placed the lens into the bag, we now address the traumatic mitriasis using microforceps. The iris is pulled towards the center and any of the adhesions uh, to the angle and anterior synecdia are lysed. As you can see, most of the madrasis is inferior and this is where we are doing our pulling. Um, once we've deemed that enough has been done in order to allow us to do a pupoplasty, we then tr introduce our tenoproline on a curved needle and take a number of bites along the inferior 180 degrees. We then bring out the needle through the cornea as I said earlier our goal here is to um, make the pupil smaller and inferior so we've cut the needle off we now pull one end of the suture out through the main wound and then pull the second end, the other end of the suture out in the same area uh, pulling the needle through that wound and then we will tie purely so that the iris is made smaller and the pupil is made smaller in this area. As you can see we do this and then we repeat the process again um, in the lateral aspect of this eye in order to create a semi-round pupil. So having taken two purchases we've now completed and tied and made a smaller pupil. At the conclusion of the case, we can see that we've addressed the patient's traumatic cataract and traumatic madriasis and have obtained a very good result for him. In summary, 
this case demonstrates blunt injury in a pediatric aged individual. We know that blunt injury is more common in males and can occur in a ratio of 12 to 1 when compared to females. It is usually unilateral. In India, about 75% of the injuries occur in those of lower socioeconomic status and 92% usually from the rural areas. In terms of the mechanism, wooden sticks, firecrackers, and bows and arrows are the most common causes of blunt eye trauma. And in, as this case demonstrates, it is possible to have secondary or delayed surgery if there's no prolonged inflammation or uncontrolled IOP or retinal detachment. Also, if the patient is outside of the amblyogenic age, meaning that he's older than seven or eight years of age, and in cases in which follow-up can be assured. Thank you for your kind attention. I would like to thank the Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association, and especially my good friend, Mohan Rajan, for inviting me to... Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, George. I think it was a brilliant video and uh, all the um, parameters of protocols for a traumatic cataract has been... Uh, uh, we'll start from uh, Sujata because he, did, uh, he didn't do SFT. He did a first string pupilloplasty and uh, because it gives, uh, especially uh, uh, when you have a large pupil like this, the SFT does not... Uh, uh, it's not cosmetically very good when compared to the pupilloplasty, first string pupilloplasty, we were able to get a round pupil and uh, 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 Sujata has got, uh, because she also does a lot of first string pupilloplasty as well. Sujata, what's your take on this? And second thing is, he didn't use a CTR. Though there was a zonular, he just placed the multi-piece uh, lens in that axis. So how differently you would have done? Uh, I, I think <clears throat> this is an exact uh, comparison with Anagha's case because this was a traumatic uh, subluxation. And you can see that that area of the zonule is absent and it's just about two clock hours. So uh, doing a regular cataract and implanting a lens, uh, which he did, I think would work fine because the chance of progressive zone low, uh, lysis is not there in this patient. So I think the way he handled the case was excellent. The second point is uh, he didn't do a complete encirclage. Uh, he did, uh, I think, part by part, and uh, he tried to make it as round as possible. <clears throat> I mean, that's also a good uh, technique, um, and uh, it's a little bit, and doing encirclage is a little bit uh, tricky because you really have to take very close bites. If you don't take close bites, and um, there's always a chance of cheese wiring while we're doing it, and uh, the, the other point is the stenzero polypropylene needle is not exactly made to do an encirclage because it's very straight. And as you start working on it, it becomes bent. And then uh, the axis through which you uh, insert into the iris changes at every, uh, uh, every step. And the sharper point will not sometimes be uh, presentable. So that is, it's a little bit tricky. And but I think he managed it very beautifully. And he did segment by segment. He did the encirclage, and it's uh, come out uh, really well. I think it's a very well handled case. And um, I don't think I would have done it any differently. <clears throat> Maybe uh, if I look at that pupil, I think the superior aspect didn't require an encirclage at all. The only the inferior portion which was traumatized need, uh, needed a suture. So I'd have just gone ahead and done an SFT only in the inferior portion. <clears throat> because there's a traumatic metriasis and uh, there's a quite large pupil. Obviously, you need to uh, give a 360 degree coverage for the pupil. Read to um, anything differently would have done. Yeah, I would say that in all cases where you are having a blunt trauma, uh, one is the pre-op workup again, one should look, uh, keep in mind the uh, chance of angle recession. I don't know how uh, long after the injury the patient has presented. Secondly, we must keep in mind there could be what we think is a blunt trauma, there could be a retained intraocular foreign body that should also be on the back of our mind. Thirdly, I would like to say I would have still injected uh, triamcinolone before uh, putting in tripan blue and checking for any uh, presence of vitreous in that area where there was zonular dehiscence. And maybe uh, initially starting off a rexis and putting a capsular hook before, uh, you know, completing the rexis. I think these are the only things I would have probably looked into.
wonderful wonderful points uh, ritu and um, uh, paneer uh, uh, like dr beko said uh, the traumatic attack in young adults especially young boys is more common nowadays and we also face the challenges that he has faced and he has uh, handled it very well the people of plastic part i don't have much experience with that but he has done it and the uh, routine cataract surgery he has done uh, again uh, calculating the iol power the routine challenges you have to manage otherwise it was a well done surgery and it was a great learning thank you i think the first string what he did was uh, quadrant by quadrant and I, i think he did a good job in sort of doing an sft but uh, it has ultimately the result was very good ramurthy anything different you would have done i think one very important point that he made was that you know there's no hurry to operate on these cases you know you can as well as far as the iop is not raised lens matter is not in the anterior chamber and uh, posterior segment in the b scan is all right you can as well wait for these eyes to cool down and then do the surgery in a more controlled manner as he did and this was not really a bursting suture he made because then that means it would have to go 360 degrees and yeah. uh, uh, sujatha very nicely pointed out the Uh, difficulties of doing such a thing basically what we did was something like a sipsers knot and that was the whole way with, by which the uh, these kind of uh, enlarged uh, pupils were being handled but now i think a uh, uh, fourth row pupilloplasty seem to be a more elegant way of handling these situations and uh, maybe just uh, if we had done a sft both inferiorly and temporally that would have given almost uh, similar results as what he attained which also was very good and as the guys again as sujatha pointed out this is a non progressive capsular i mean uh, um, <coughs> the zonular weakness and uh, basically except for those two quadrants rest of the area is quite normal so putting in a three piece lens with the uh, haptics buttressing the area of the um, zonular weakness would also be quite sufficient i think overall the case was uh, well handled with a good outcome i'm just asking uh, the uh, um, since the speaker is not here uh, before i'm ta- talking about long time back before the advent of this pupillary plastic and other things would you leave the traumatic metriasis like that without doing anything i think we always used to do that you know for a long time and i'm sure even now 90% of the ophthalmologists are doing that and mm-hmm. not everybody is handling the iris what we need to remember is that you know the rexis is likely to opacify the rexis margin and very often if you get a 4 4.5 mm excess the rest of it is uh, going to opacify the effective uh, pupil is going to be 4 mm or so uh, that can also lead on to a significant amount of photophobia but then patients do live with that those are uh, those were the days when uh, patients used to have a sector radiotomy and etc and they never used to talk about uh, these aspects now only that we are looking at uh, better outcomes and better results so these are additional points Yeah, I think it's a very good uh, point what you have mentioned. And Anaga, anything different you would have done in this? I sir, I think it's an excellent uh, demonstration of lovely surgery and uh, very very well done. And I think in such cases where there is a traumatic like surge side, if there is increased intraocular pressure, and I had a similar case just a few days ago where there was a boy with an injury and uh, he had angle recession plus. eye pressure was extremely high and even post operatively the pressure continues to be high and he had a posterior capsular a posterior capsular rupture also on which was detected even on the iol master in fact so mm-hmm. i think such cases we have to be very wary about uh, such things also and then keep all the armamentarium ready in the form of vitrectomy and all that as and when required i think the traumatic cataract is uh, definitely a very very tricky situation and you should should have a plan a b c everything even d for that matter uh, before you deal this uh, case so we go on to the since you're running short of time we go on to the next speaker and uh, dr suraj nayak who heads the pediatric ophthalmology department rajan aikar he is a fellow of the um, uh, pediatric ophthalmology from shankar netralia very very fantastic uh, uh, pediatric ophthalmologist very good surgeon and he is going to show us something totally different suraj all are yours thank you sir thanks a lot uh, good afternoon to all panelists and speakers and i am very grateful to dr mohan rajan sir to give me such opportunity on this platform to present a video in front of all stalwarts 
So for me, as a novice surgeon, every case is very, very, very challenging, and I feel it very difficult. So I decided to present a case. Uh, Can you share the video? Yes, sir. I'm ready. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So I've decided to uh, present a case. Uh, I might think it's very simple, but I would stress a very important point. Uh, let me start with a quote. So the Mr. Kerwin Ray says that make your vision so clear that your fears become irrelevant. That means our visibility should be very, very, very clear where we are going, what we are doing inside the eye before we attempt anything. So based on this, I would, uh, this theme, I'll just uh, give an overview that this is a secondary eye oil implantation uh, in a four-year-old child. He has been operated for congenital cataract surgery at the age of six months in Rajan I care. So I'll just start the surgery and keep talking, sir. So he was left aphakic and we were dealing, uh, we were managing the amblyopia with the contact lenses and the uh, aphakic glasses. Uh, now, as he was four year old, so uh, he was not accepting any glasses. So we start decided to put a secondary aisle. And uh, here, as uh, we are trying to release the adhesions, just pulling it out to see if anything is there. So it was a little freely going ahead. Now the center part has to be clear. So with anterior vitrectomy, uh, the central opacity is removed. And uh, now the anterior vitrectomy is being done and we'll remove it. So the central uh, part is clear. Now we plan for uh, implantation of three-piece eye oil in the sulcus. So the attempt was made. So as we go ahead, uh, here the visibility is not very high, but still trying to insert the eye oil. And it was misplaced when uh, we tried to go ahead more. So we have to take it out because it was going not in the sulcus, it was going straight inside the vitreous. So we have to take the eye oil and we have to increase our visibility, which is a very, very, very important point which I have learned always. And I try to follow, and sometimes I don't hear. So after removing the sinicate, that part was cut actually in the video. We put the iris soap, which is easily available. And a uh, lot of people are uh, like uh, hesitate to use the iris soap. It's easily available and cost effective also. So in this case, uh, we have put iris soap. So the visibility is totally clear where the lens is going. Then the sulcus IOL was uh, inserted. And you could do a PI because it's a sulcus eye oil, so we have to do a PI. After viscoelastic wash, we just try to close the anterior chamber with the sutures as it is a PDD cataract, so compulsory sutures we apply. So this is a, so what the salient points only I wanted to stress is the adequate visibility on the operating area prevents complication and we should release all the sinicate and uh, never uh, hesitate to use the iris soaks and it should be promoted to all of us like the novice surgeons. So thank, thanks a lot, sir, for the presentation. Very nice, uh, Suraj. I think it's a very uh, beautiful, elegant video, I would say. Uh, this is a very important message. Uh, uh, I just want to know because uh, if you want to see the sulcus, it's important that you have a good view of the sulcus before you put the lens. So you put the iris hooks and the first uh, time you didn't do it uh, because your visibility was very poor and the lens was going into the... But why did you remove the lens? You could have just put the lens, kept the lens in the anterior chamber and gone ahead with the uh, iris. Why did you enlarge the incision? remove the lens and put uh, the iris hooks 
he could have just kept the lens in the anterior chamber and then put the iris roots there and then identified where exactly the sulcus is and then put the uh, tucked in the uh, lens into the sulcus so i just wanted to uh, ask you one and then before we go on to the panel starting from dr ramurthy suraj sir, i want to, yeah yes sir uh, the maneuvers i was a little apprehensive on doing it with the iol uh, in the anterior chamber even after putting a visco elastic so i thought i'll remove it and then uh, safely place it I will, that's only apprehension i had so instead of going that i removed it sir. okay anyway ultimately the result is good ramurthy uh, the the message we wanted to give i want him to show the video is that when you have a pcr sometimes you put the lens in the sulcus so the pupil become small and next day you find the lens on the retina okay the when you have a pcr or any complication for that matter and the pupil become small because the prostaglandins are getting released in the eye yeah. and always use iris hooks to find out where exactly your sulcus is before you put the lens so that is a message i want to give everybody uh, though it's a very simple message but i thought it is a very important message ramurthy your take on this oh excellent uh, one i think it's extremely important you should see what you are doing and you yes. know if we do it blindly then always you might by luck go into the uh, sulcus but especially in this kind of a situation there is likely to be a lot of uh, posterior sinicae also and even though you might try to release it it's a good idea to put the iris hooks first see where exactly you are and go ahead and place the intraocular lens and uh, one thing i realized of course whether in the primary surgery itself intraocular lens would have been placed is a question of course for 6 months old we don't do a uh, intraocular lens implantation in children who are less than 1 year old we would have done what you had done but yeah. he did an anti vitrectomy initially but even in these situations always you would have done a uh, uh, posterior capsulotomy as well as anti vitrectomy because we want the optical uh, uh, access to be extremely clear and even a intact uh, hyaloid could be amblyogenic so essentially in these situations when you do a second brain implant in pediatric cataracts we find that the vitrectomy is not necessary because uh, it's already been done in the first phase and uh, as regards the uh, choice of the intraocular lens i think a three piece lens is the right way to go and uh, it was not very clear as to what exactly was the margins of the rexus but in case he had uh, four hooks inside right in the beginning and uh, the rexus margin was uh, nicely visible maybe creating an optic capture also would have been possible which would have also stabilized the lens in the long run for this uh, young child i think it's a very good point and uh, yeah paneer But, uh, yeah, in the adult cases where you have a problem, the pupil is small and you want to place the lens in the sulcus. My technique is I just put the leading haptic in the anterior chamber, come out, and then with a the Macpherson forces, I pull and lift up the iris, and then go and dial it in. That's a technique I use because I don't use uh, iris hook to see where whether it has gone into the sulcus. That's my technique. Uh, that's what I practice. <clears throat> what about the leading haptic sir how will you know whether it's gone there no initial leading haptic you just go in and then place it over the iris and then yes. pull back and then lift up the iris with your macpherson forceps yes fcc is much easier uh when oh, it's easier yes. okay uh, right <laughs> Oh, very often in adult cataracts, we find the pupil comes down by the time we implant the lens. In all these cases, obviously, as Paneer said, we don't uh, go ahead and iris hook. Usually, what I do in these situations, if I have to put the lens in the sulcus, is to inject viscoelastic just behind the iris, so as to bloat up the space between the uh, rexus margin and the iris, and then implant the uh, leading haptic itself into that space. And usually, you are able to localize it and uh, just. Uh, when the trailing uh, haptic also inside direction is more important yes uh, the uh, uh, no paneer i just want to ask you uh, what will you do with the okay leading haptic you are putting there the trailing haptic i don't dial it inside what i do is i use a macpherson again i do what is called uh, the uh, uh, the drop technique i drop the haptic into the sulcus instead of dialing it if you dial it you don't have any control i don't dial it i use ah. a person forceps i push it straight towards the 6 o'clock position no no i'm i'm not talking about the leading haptic sir i'm trailing the trailing haptic trailing haptic yes trailing haptic i hold it at the maximum curvature 
Tuck it. 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 It sucks it. Just, it just it gets cut. There's a drop technique, not the dialing technique. No, no, no. I don't use a dialer at all. So that's a message I want to give. No, don't dial these lenses yeah. into the sulcus because if you dial it, there is a possibility it can go underneath the rexus. And you'll have one uh, a haptic in the, in the sulcus, the other haptic, in, and then uh, invariably these lenses will fall into the vitreous cavity. Yeah. Yeah. So in such cases, I would use a keep a dialer on the side port, retract the iris, and then do it under visualization. So the other point I wanted to make was uh, the pupil was not dilating at all. So were there a lot of uh, posterior synecae and those should have been released before because even if you're putting in the sulcus, sometimes the uh, haptic, both the haptics do not uh, you know, remain there if there are a lot of synecae and the lens can get displaced on a long-term basis. Yeah, it was released. It was released. Only thing is, it's not it was released. Part. Video, we have not shown. Actually. Not, not shown that part. It was released. The lot of the lot of the sinuses is likely to be there because it is a, a six month. Uh, uh, at that the age of six months, we are operated, and uh, the patient is coming after the after almost three and a half uh, four years now, and uh, sinuses is likely to be there. We need to open up that space very nicely and probably use iris hooks. Sujata, anything differently you have done? I have two comments. One is, <clears throat> well, I agree with Ramoti that pupillary capture has to be done because invariably in these patients that we find pediatric age group when you operate, they go in for a pupillary capture. If you don't do a, a, a primary capture of the lens, then the lens comes forward and you develop the patient goes in for a pupillary capture. Almost all pediatric patients, they land up like that. So it's very important that you capture the uh, lens uh, There's a when you are injecting the lens. That is one thing. The second thing is doing a PI in a temporal area is not a good thing because you know what, the patient is going to have double vision. So it's important that you do a very small PI in the superior aspect. So you, you had done the PI in the temporal area where you had made this uh, section. So uh, there's a likelihood of two things happening. One is the haptic coming out through that opening because the opening was very large and you had placed the, uh, the lens <coughs> uh, horizontally. The second uh, problem the patient is going to have is double vision because of the, it's, in the pupil, in the, it's in the visual axis, it's in the palpable fissure. So those two things I think we should have avoided. And Alton, you can use a cutter to do the PI. Just go in Use a cutter. Yeah, PI is okay because then you make a very small PI. You really, you can make the PI. Anyway, well, well done and uh, all the, the result. And in, in, uh, uh, this patient has got, I think, a six nine vision. If I'm right, Suraj. Yes, six, sir, nine nine vision, uh, which is uh, simply amazing. And uh, for a patient who has been, uh, we thought there's bilateral cataract. This uh, child had where when the patient came to me, bilateral mature cataract, and that's the reason why uh, at the age of uh, I think five months, I operated the child and uh, the patient is doing very well. No, I don't think even a PI is necessary in these cases, in all these cases. There's so many sulcus implanted cases where we don't do... No, no PI is necessary, Ramut. No, 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 I, no, I don't think so because, you know, you don't have an intact anterior hyaloid. You have done an anterior vitrectomy. There is a lens in there. This thing. There is enough space for the uh, fluid to circulate. So I personally have done, done a PI in these situations and I've never struggled because of that. And the, uh, the chambers are also quite deep in these cases. Please, please understand uh, one thing, Ramurthy, is that these children are going to live for the next 80 years. And there is a possibility of a chronic angled kosher glaucoma, which has been reported in a sulcus IOA. And if you have a PI, see, nothing, you're not going to lose anything by doing a PI. After all, you're doing a surgery, which you're opening up the sulcus. Another extra small step, just go with the vitrector, and probably do a small PI, and uh, I think it's going to be, it's not going to do no more benefit than uh, um, That is my personal opinion. I don't, I, I want the other panelists to comment on this. So, Paneer? The PA is not a must because of the present situation, but there's nothing wrong in doing if you want to be more careful. Very diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Mohan, uh, unless you have pupillary block, they will not okay. have an angle closure, Mohan. I don't think PI is needed. Yeah. And the second thing is, I do all, most of my YAC PI in any, any comfortable position, including temporal. None of my patients have complained of diplopia. 
I don't believe that uh, a temporal PI like this will cause diplopia. No, no, no. It's a little. If you if you notice the video, it is a little large PI. That's the reason why. It's large. Why is it that way? Little large. It's large. It should be yeah. beyond the optic. You just talk to the patient. I'll be surprised if he has diplopia. No, no. You, you, you. Know, a lot of people they tell me when they see a light, they are seeing double. Even very small yak PIs which are done temporarily, they come. They tell me that I'm seeing double when I'm lighting a lamp. The kuttavalaka, I'm seeing double two lights. So they do have. It all depends on how intelligent the patient is and able to correlate with that. And this PI, I think, is a little bit larger than what uh, normally would uh, expect in a particular uh, pediatric age group. Uh, uh, Sujatha, it's like this: when you have two entrances into the eye, and you have a human lens. They both both will go to the same focus. You don't have two focus. You don't get diplopia. In this particular patient, you're having an epiphytic zone and a six millimeter intraocular lens, and the PA is beyond that. You'll have one blur, and you'll have an image. But in a epiphytic patient, you cannot be you theoretically should not have diplopia because they're all focusing on the same place. It means to be seen. The take home message is: ask <laughs> them not to light a lamp. That's an important thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> to avoid diplopia, <laughs> we go on. Yeah, we go on to the next speaker, and uh, again, he's a big stalwart guy who is uh, known for his innovation, lateral thinking. His uh, knowledge in ophthalmology is simply amazing. None other than my very, very close friend. I have learned personally. We have learned a lot from Ramesh, and uh, his videos are really amazing. He runs a very, very busy hospital called Sundar Eye Hospital in. Uh, Uh, Ananagar, and he is one of the main reasons why I don't get any patients from that area. And <laughs> so, uh, over to Ramesh, please. Mohan, I, I have started screen share. Can you can you see my video? Yes, uh, yes, uh, Ramesh. Video. Okay. Please Thanks, go. Mohan. So yeah. I I had no uh, interesting patients till yesterday. I operated on this boy. 24 years old he had a 440 volt transformer burst which caused a huge scar on the forehead scars on both hands and in in the forearm of the left forearm he came at 624 with this kind of capsular fibrosis yes was it uh, i will must 700 show subcapsular nice no flake cataract so although he had this kind of a plaque or fibrosis it was a subcapsular snow flake cataract that was causing the drop in vision So, fundus exam was like looking through a frosted glass. When you looked at the lens thickness, it was interesting that the this eye had a three millimeter lens, while the fellow lens was three point six five. This lens has actually shrunken, and this was one year after injury. He had a mild bitter uh, against the rule cylinder needing a T three. A quick literature review showed that six percent of people with an electrical injury will develop cataracts. most of them will require surgery as it is progressive and they usually present within a year of the injury so this is a right eye of this uh, young uh, young uh, engineer the surgery part is pretty much routine there is that is nothing very interesting in that so we make a standard temporal incision with a superior uh, uh, side port and um, eye is a bit soft i make a small Smile cut so that I don't have chemosis. I I don't make a clear corneal. I like to do a small conjunctival entry and then into the eye. So I do the easy part of the capsule excess first. That is, I do the clear uh, uh, part of the capsule first. I learned a lot from Dr. Deepak Medhur's talk. So this will not be capsule fibrosis. This is more of a plaque. After seeing his video, I think I would try to dissect this if if he had if I had operated on him on him on Monday, but I did the surgery on Saturday yesterday at about ten o ten in the morning. So I do it the conventional way. I just did a easy part of the rexus and then I cut through the plaque. I have two options. I can cut beyond the plaque and remove it fully, or I can cut through that. When I cut through that, it is more stable and it and it's lots more safer. as the angle is not comfortable i make an uh, another entry and i complete the uh, incision on the plug to this second incision so these 1 mm micro forceps and micro scissors make our anterior segment surgery so much more easier 
and there are many manufacturers who are supplying them. So once this is done, the remaining part of the surgery is like, like a routine cataract. There is no nucleus to speak of. So I remove this in the next few seconds by the technique made popular by Dr. Pradeep Mohanto, the DISH technique. D-I-S-H stands for do it somehow, just remove it off. Now this 24-year-old guy had a postprandial sugar of 140 and a fasting sugar of 120. He's well on his way to diabetes. He's a little overweight. So I say, I take some time and clean up the cells on the anterior capsule. I want to leave back as few cells as possible. There is a little bit of cells on the posterior capsule, which I remove with a power wash. Then a routine uh, uh, toric lens. As you all know, I do a single step marking with a 26 gauge disposable needle on the slit lamp. And uh, right here on the cornea, you will see a small uh, line which I've aligned the lens to. A little bit of the flap uh, of the fibrosis or plaque is still there. I make one more nick and I remove that. And with that, the surgery is over. I'm not sure you can see. You can see a faint line on the cornea. This is the scratch made yeah, on the yeah, cornea. Yeah. Preoperatively, yeah. and I've and I've aligned the lens. So subcapsular snowflake cataracts are well known to occur after an electrical burn in some other part of the body and in the face. These patients regain excellent vision after surgery. Thanks, Mohan, for asking me to present this simple case. Beautiful. It's not a simple case, uh, Ramesh. It's a beautiful case. I think a lovely video and lovely um, the way you manage that. Uh, can you suggest? Uh, yeah. Uh, manage that uh, plaque uh, there. Only thing is, uh, differently what Deepak did and what you did was you removed the plaque along with the capsule. Am I right? Whereas oh, you did yes. the capsulorexis and because it's a subcapsular plaque yeah, he, and he tried to remove the plaque uh, separately. In total, yes. In total, in total because uh, uh, suppose this plaque was a little, uh, what do you call, yeah. more uh, central then you would have gone round the rex, round the plaque, exactly. and then probably uh, removed the plaque underneath. The, uh, how differently you would have done it? Uh, uh, exactly like like what he said. Me because in the center, I would have just made a normal capsule rexus. I would not have had to use the scissors. Even in this particular patient, I now wonder whether I, I should have tried to dissect the plaque and peel it off, and then continue with the rexus. After seeing what Deepak did, we could have yes, seen yes. the easy part, and then gone in with the micro forceps, teased it and see whether the plug peels off. But uh, I was wondering whether, because if you if you have the central plug and the, the plug would have come along with the rexes, no? Am I right? Yes, Mohan. If it had been a yes. small central plug, we would have just done a Ramurthy, uh, Ramurthy, yes. Ramurthy, your comments on this. Oh, I think beautiful surgery and a very uh, unusual situation and uh, good learning points. Uh, one thing I just want to emphasize is that in these, of course, he's an expert surgeon. I would have always stained the capsule. You know, I find that uh, whenever there's any kind of opacity in the capsule, whether it's traumatic or anything, then it's always a good idea. It makes visualization better. Uh, even the cutting of the rexes that he did uh, would have been there would have been better visualization and where it joins the rest of the rexes. I think uh, uh, to take a um, point out of what Deepak showed. It's not always that you have a separate uh, plaque and it not, may not be possible to separate them in all these cases. So sometimes the, uh, the addition is uh, to the rest of the capsule, the anterior capsule is so thick that you might have to remove the way Ramesh did. And just another point I would uh, say is that since he put in a toric intraocular lens, because as he said, the rest of the surgery was fairly routine. Maybe I would have aimed at a slightly smaller rexus because then I would not have enlarged that uh, uh, capsular rexus in the end because the opacity was in the periphery. I would have been more keen on getting a good uh, capsule coverage onto the lens. Another point, uh, the more, just to evoke some discussion, is that a young patient, unilateral cataract, why not a multifocal toric? He is to have a presbyopic glasses right through his life in one eye. Yeah, multifocal toric would have been a good option. Anyway, but uh, Ramurthy, I would like to, yes, uh, emphasize that point. Because why did you end up, because that plaque was anyway, that opacity was in the periphery and it was giving a good coverage of the lens. When he enlarged it, it went beyond the optic. 
So there is a possibility that there can be a, a forward movement of the toric lens, you know. And if you, when you have a forward movement, there's a possibility of rotation also. So Paneer, I want your uh, take on this because I want a Rexis, as Ramurti said, slightly smaller, not very small. But Mohan, course, Mohan, I'm on. I'll just make a point, Mohan. Yes. The smaller than optic Rexis is very important for getting a spherical equivalent refractive uh, good, good vision. But the toric lens stability does not at all depend on the anterior capsule touching on the anterior part of the optic. Toric lens stability is more to do with how the ends of the aptic are, are in relation with the equator. This is the truth, Mohan. So a large bag, small bag, large excess, it doesn't really matter. But but if you if you put a toric lens where you have peripheral touch, it will, it will not rotate. I don't expect any change in the axis in this patient. No, no, the no, outcome, no. I totally agree. You must yes. have a you must have an overlap. But these are he is going to become a diabetic. He's 24, he's a pre-diabetic. This guy needs to have a large, uh, and many retinal surgeons are going to see him in the future. I would prefer to have a very, very large rexis in these patients. I feel diabetes is a long-term threat. And uh, uh, toric multifocals, I, as you all know, I am totally against multifocal lenses. But in this patient, I did ask him about that. I, I, did, I, I did make an offer. Due to financial constraint, he wanted to not to choose that. I, he actually wanted concession. So I didn't charge surgeons fee for this patient, but he paid the balance. So he, he couldn't afford to pay for a toric multifocal, but I did ask him whether he's interested in that. What was the balance, with Ramesh? Balance was, was 55 Mohan. <laughs> anyway, Paneer, yeah. yeah. See, the conventional teaching is that when you have a toric lens or a multifocal, for that matter, any, you think that you should have a rexis which can overlap. So, uh, how, uh, yeah. Because this yeah. Rexis, yeah, yeah. In this case, because I will skip the opacity, make a smaller rexis if possible. I will not cut through the uh, block. Either I'll circumvent it or uh, make a smaller rexis, finish everything, then decide whether to uh, ex uh, extend the rexis. That's what I would have planned. Ramesh cut through that. It was a good technique, probably. It gave more stability. Um, that's all. Ramesh? Mm, yeah. So two points. One is, you know, the cosmetically, I think Ramesh looked at it because if you're able to see the visible plaque, a patient being a young patient, probably unmarried, that would be cosmetically unacceptable to the patient. That's the reason I think no, no, it, to remove uh, the plaque. That is one thing. In the periphery, no. How can it be visible? It can still be visible. If he's married, it can still be visible. Okay. <clears throat> the second point is, I don't agree with Ramesh that the movement uh, of the lens does not depend upon the rexus because we do see patients in the early postoperative period, there is a forward movement of the lens if there is no coverage, if it is not being kept in place by the rexus. That is one thing. And third and most important point, which I, I think all these things are in the this thing, the third point, knowing that the patient is pre-diabetic, why did you touch the epithelium? Why do you scratch the epithelium when you can use, could have used a marker? Making a trivial injury on an epithelium. <laughs> are... Sujatar, Sujatar, no problem. This will heal. I have cut into the eye. I have made a lot of uh, no, no, no. more dangerous that, damage. That is, see, when you're creating an epithelial mark, using a, a scratch, there's yes. no cause for this patient to go in for recurrent corneal erosion. Not at all, Sujatar. This will heal, this will heal beautifully. And uh, along the scratch, <laughs> along the scratch, yeah. the retinous membrane will have, will have micro additions with small fibrosis, they'll get strongly attached. They will not have REC. No, but no. do you have anything against uh, markers? Do you have anything against... This is the best way to mark Sujata. Do you have something against this technique? No, no, it's a good technique. I don't, I don't like anybody touching the epithelium unnecessarily. There's no need for you to scratch the epithelium. Because, you know, there are, so many things can happen. The patient can develop infection. If a patient can develop an infiltrate, they can go in for recurrent corneal erosions. Because very... Often it's only the trivial injury on the epithelium which causes the recurrent erosion to come. Uh, Sujata, I no, don't no, think no. you have done this. Have the argument later, please. Please, Ramesh. Over the phone, we can do that. Because people, two people are waiting. Ritu, quick yeah. comments. Yeah, so uh, see, basically we are talking about uh, toric eyewell stability. I feel if it is well covered, at least three-fourths of the rexus is well covering the uh, IOL margin as it was in uh, this case. I don't think lens uh, is going to get destabilized in the early post-op period. 
secondly was uh, whether to put uh, what kind of lens to choose i would have definitely gone for a edof toric lens in such a patient maybe not a multifocal considering he is a pre diabetic but a edof toric i think would have given him a good uh, near vision as well as it would have taken care of uh, you know the retina surgeons uh, visibility issues in uh, uh, multifocal lenses so i think um, uh, he did a great job one important point was that it's better to cut through the plaque rather than try to go beyond the plaque initially i think that is a very important point that dr ramesh has brought about yeah i think beyond the plaque is uh, ruled out because it's already near the equator so periphery it is uh, beyond the plaque you would have gone into the zonal area and would have lost that excess as well anyway very good uh, ramesh i think it's a beautiful uh, video and nice take home points and then we go on to the next uh, most beautiful ophthalmologist uh, in uh, india and uh, none other than dr divya kartik fantastic surgeon with aravind eye hospital chennai and uh, divya is always a part of rajanai care seminars and uh, she is going to show us some very very interesting video thank you for the opportunity tnoa and uh, mohan sir so this is a case of a 40 year old who presented with a trauma 9 months ago and uh, he was managed elsewhere and they had done pi at multiple places at 3 5 and 9 o'clock as you see and his vision was 5 by 60 uh, at presentation there was gross phacodonesis so we planned to do a small incision cataract surgery for him and extract his cataract Uh, so I went ahead uh, using a crescent uh, with the steroconial tunnel. So there was a gross phacodonesis. So we planned to remove the cataract in total. Did side ports anticipating uh, anterior vitrectomy. So I did two side ports on either side, 180 degrees apart. Injected uh, adrenaline to kind of dilate the pupil, and he also had uh, traumatic mitriasis and also a lot of uh, uh, multiple sphincter tears. Keratometry is done. And, uh, the lens, uh, using the bimanual technique, I tried to uh, bring it to the anterior chamber. The lens extraction is done. our anterior uh, vitrectomy is uh, done using the two side ports that we made the eye was uh, kind of soft uh, so i had to inject visco in between which is edited in this video our anterior vitrectomy done and uh, now i have inserted the uh, three piece eye oval and i plan to do an iris suture uh, uh, eye oval so i use a tenno proline suture uh, with a long curved needle So what happens is, uh, because there are a lot of multiple uh, PIs which are large, uh, my preferred technique would have otherwise been the iris claw. But since there were a lot of uh, PIs and the iris was also not very stable, I plan to do the iris fixated uh, using uh, sutures. So I, I'm using the mechanical suturing technique, uh, side port done, and uh, the two ends of the proline suture exteriorized using a good lens work. the other end of the suture is cut and uh, exteriorized and uh, the knot is again pushed back into the into the anterior chamber and again inject visco elastic and uh, i try to push the other fabric into the under the iris gently push it and what uh, what happens is uh, the haptic 
disengages. The one that I fixed to the iris kind of disengages. Not completely though, but uh, the eye oil has tilted. So I feel it's not right. And I uh, again, remove the eye oil. I know I plan to uh, again do the iris fixation, but in a different position. So I do the inferior and superior uh, fixation of the haptics. Rather than doing this uh, temporal and or nasal fixation. So, this uh, haptic disengagement can happen. All of us think, uh, you know, whatever surgeries that are shown in all the conferences look so beautiful, but this can happen. So, it's good to uh, know that this can happen and we should be aware of it. I push the other half. They can use the spatula to hold the lens. And here, instead of uh, creating a passage in the cornea, I exteriorize the sutures through the main tunnel that I've made. I apply a tunnel suture and uh, injection moxifloxin at the end and cauterize the conjunctiva as well. This is post-op day one, mild uh, edema present, and uh, this was one month post-op. Patient has a vision of about uh, six six parts. Fantastic, Divya. Yes, sir. Very nice video. Very nice video. I just wanted to, before we go on to the panelists, I wanted to ask you two questions. One is, why you didn't attempt a FACO? Otherwise. Why not a past planar lensectomy? Why no you did a SICS for this patient, number one? Number two is, what is the reason? Because you had fixed that haptic quite well into the iris. What is the reason for the disengagement in the first, the first time? So the answer to the first question, sir, I am not a retina person. So I did not attempt a past planar vitrectomy and I didn't want this case to go to Karthik. So I managed it myself. Well, inform Karthik. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, SIC is because it was gross phacodonesis, sir. So I, I didn't want to push the lens in again. So that's why we plan to do a, a small incision cataract surgery and remove the lens in total. And uh, the second question, I think uh, the, the way the haptic was directed, sir. So it was when I was trying to move the uh, trailing haptic, I kind of uh, pulled it in the reverse direction. So I think that's why it moved away. Yeah, okay, we'll start from this side, Sujata. Quickly, one or two words because we have only one more surgery. I'm always amazed. I've seen several of your surgeries coming from Arvind, you know, the suturing taking through the cornea. I really don't know how you do it, and you're not even you're not even bending the tensile uh, polypropylene needle, otherwise it bends so badly really do a fantastic job of it. I think it's a wonderful technique if you really uh, got the hang of it. <clears throat> For me, I mean, I think it's uh, it's quite difficult. And the other uh, thing, worry is always, like you said, you know, the disengagement of the other haptic while you are trying to suture this. That is one thing. Second point is, um, in this particular case, I noticed is the pupils were not really round, even post-operatively. Does it happen all the time or is it because it's with a traumatized case and already the pupils were uh, irregular? So yes, that is one this is more due, due to the trauma. But otherwise, you have a nice round pupil. Okay, right. So it's a very well done surgery and uh, beautiful. I know it's a very difficult case, but I you know the, your videos, Hari Priyas and your videos are all make it look so easy. But uh, identifying that haptic and going around that haptic uh, underneath the iris, uh, uh, it's a little difficult for us. Any Ritu? I would agree uh, with Dr. Uh, Mohan that I would have attempted a FACO in this case. And if uh, FACO was not possible, I mean, after using, say, um, iris hooks, after proper visualization, if you feel that the bag is not stable and CTR would not help, 
then I would have sent the patient to my husband and Ajay would have managed with lensectomy and a glue diver. Uh, somehow I'm not comfortable personally with SICS and I would not have gone for SICS. I would have definitely attempted FICO. That is because you are comfortable with your husband, but she is not comfortable with her husband. That is the problem. That is the difference. Anyway, Anir. Yeah. Yeah. The choice of IOM, she did the iris suturing, but I would have preferred you know, iris cloth because a lot of iris tissues there, in spite of the PA equals Yes. Arterial fixation would have been much better. That's what I would have preferred. Otherwise, a great surgery. No, why, not? why not an iris cloth? Because it's only a peripheral eye. Why not an iris cloth? Uh, I, I love I doing iris cloth, the yeah. iris fixation is a very rare surgery that I do. I love the iris claw, but somehow I felt there were too many PIs and uh, the iris was not, I mean, I, I was not comfortable. I thought it might, you know. Ramurthy. Yeah, I, I agree with the way the lens was removed. We, she said there was severe phacodonosis and uh, I might have even done an intracapsular cataract extraction for this patient. Just remove the lens in total. As far as race, my choice of lens would have been uh, iris claw lens. I've never done this uh, uh, surgery and I think it's amazing the way they do it. And I've never tried it. So uh, once you put intracameral pilocarpine and constrict the pupil, then I think there would have been reasonably enough iris tissue, at least in some axis, where you can enclave the, uh, what, the iris claw lens. And I, that lens might have been my choice in this particular case, but otherwise, very well done, and uh, the results is what matters. And I wonder, as far as the slight distortion which was there at the end of the surgery, which persisted in the post-operative period also, whether it was because the suture or the tucking in of the bit of the iris tissue, maybe at the end of the surgery, just sweeping with a um, iris, what, uh, iris reposter and seeing whether you, you can get a round pupil, because it started out with a reasonably round pupil. Uh, might have I did do that, sir. Problems. I did use a spatula to uh, repos reposit the uh, suture with the iris, but it did not happen. So uh, I think I uh, pulled off excess tissue there. Right, right. I think I think to, uh, during the surgery also a little uh, the iris were a little atonic, and probably there was some trauma there to the sphincter. But anyway, very well done, uh, Divya. Thanks a lot for joining in here, and Thank you, sir. Uh, we have uh, the uh, the final. The, we have always uh, keep the best for the last and none other than the MS Dhoni of Indian ophthalmology, I would call him, uh, Nivian Madhivanan, guy who is uh, so versatile, fantastic surgeon, both anterior and posterior segment, director of the MNI hospital and the postgraduate institute, and uh, over to Nivian. Nivian? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Having here. Wonderful introduction. Respected teachers, uh, senior ophthalmologists, my dear friends. So I'm going to present a case that was challenging to me. So as you can see, this was a case of a hypermature cataract. And you can see the leaking proteinaceous material that has come to the anterior chamber. So this tells us two things even before starting the case. One, you might end up having a small hard nucleus inside. And then the zonules in these cases and the bag itself can be weak. I just went ahead and proceeded with the routine phaco emulsification. So under air bubble, profan blue was injected to stain the anterior capsule and wash. And some of these proteinaceous materials that were stuck was also released. So the excess is the key important step in any phaco case. So having a good fill of the anterior chamber is very, very important. And I started the rexus with the cystitome needle. As you can see, once the flap was raised, some more of the liquefied cortex came out. I know, sir, we could have done a punctorexis, but sometimes these bags are also very weak in these cases and you can snap more zonules. So I stopped and switched and went and did the clear corneal entry and then washed away these milky cortex. So once that was done, I again washed off all this proteinaceous material and put in visco again and continued the rexis with the rexis forceps. As you know, if you don't have any support back, uh, the cystitome cannot give you a good rexis. And also in these cases where the zonules are weak, uh, doing it with the rexis forceps is a better thing so that there is less stress on the zonules. Rexis is very key for any phaco case. So we want to get an ideal rexis. But in this case, we can see the pupil size was also small. So it was actually aimed for a slightly smaller rexis, like a 4.5 millimeter rexis. In case we have to keep the lens in the sulcus or do any kind of an optic capture. So as Atik has already mentioned that grasping and regasping and putting continuous viscoelastic is very important so that we don't want the rexis to run away in these cases. So once the rexis was complete, 
just before starting the FACO is where the controversy actually starts here. So managing these types of cases and facing complications when you have these small hard nucleuses inside. So I decided that I'll put the foldable intraocular lens in the bag. So there are going to be points on discussion on this. But this is basically because the nucleus is very small and hard. So the lens acts in two methods. One, it acts like a scaffold. And the two, when these loose bags, when the zonules are weak, it also goes and stretches the bag. So it gives you some amount of stability of the bag. So once the lens is placed inside the bag, the FACO started. So doing a direct chop technique. And we also know these uh, nucleuses can be mobile. And so it's not very easy to crack. As you can see, after the first burying, the crack was initiated to trying to get the good crack. So you got a kind of an incomplete crack. Still, the epinucleus plate was not cracked. But here, another care was taken because the pupil size was also eventually coming down. So again, burying the phaco probe, lifting it up, and then starting the crack. And there, you can see the epinucleus plate crack. So once that happens, it gives you some amount of relief in these cases. So you rotate the nucleus. And the, now we have two hemispheres of the nucleus here. So once that is there, the nucleus was gently brought into the pupillary margin. Also, care was taken to make sure that the corneal is not close to the corneal endothelium. And you can see the entire procedure is done slow and not like a routine phaco emulsification. And phaco power is also a very key important step here. It is given only when necessary so that there is no waste of phaco energy, one, to protect the corneal endothelium. And two, we are not going close to the IOL because we know we have an IOL inside there. So it can actually damage due to the vibrations of the phaco. So we're making sure we're staying in the pupillary plane. So this is almost the last piece that is slightly maneuvered out. And also the pupil is also small, broken down into smaller fragments. So that reduces the amount of phaco energy that is actually required, but very high vacuum. So you can see the pieces are out, the lens is inside. This is just to show the lens is still inside the bag. And absolutely, there is no cortex or anything that has to be removed. So that was checked thoroughly of all 360 degrees. Just a small bit of a, a nucleus fragment that is there. So I being a bimanual surgeon, I seen all the other surgeries were coaxial surgery. So me being a manual surgeon, we just removed that critical bit. And there's nothing more to do in this case. Initial three, four days, the patient did have corneal edema. That is due to the previous inflammation and the condition of the eye. But then after a week, it started clearing off and he had a very good visual recovery. So once again, I'd like to thank TNY first for giving me this wonderful opportunity, Mohan Rajan sir, and Rajan Eye Care Hospital, as uh, both Mohan Rajan and uh, Sujata Amham have always been my ophthalmic parents in my journey and always mentoring me, guiding me. And thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nivian, for the wonderful video. Um, uh, the uh, only thing is the I will scaffold, uh, if it's a very hard brown cataract, then I would not suggest uh, for two reasons. One, because the corneal endothelium is a problem. Another thing is, what happens to the IOL with the FACO energy? Is there any impact on the IOL with the FACO energy? Yes, sir. I think sir also asked me this question before. It can damage. So that's why I was very particular in choosing the case. This is only for those cases where you find that the hypermature cataract, you have a small nucleus, which is very mobile. Yeah, is a... You need space into the bag. So we're not putting an IOL in the bag when you already have a large nucleus. So that can actually cause more damage than actually harm. The second thing, the plane in where we do the phaco emulsification, the probe staying away from the IOL and also not too close to it. You know, so it's like a uh, mix between the two you know, pros and cons. It's a good technique and uh, especially for morgagin and cataracts and all because it stretches the bag and keeps the, this thing. And sometimes if you're not able to uh, see the bag. Uh, um, uh, Ramurthy, have you tried this technique? Yeah, I have tried. I have tried, you know, and uh, actually uh, it works quite well. But I thought in this case it was not needed, you know. I have tried it in cases where you have a uh, really a genuine morgagin cataract and you just have a hard brown nucleus small uh, nucleus which sort of keeps spinning around and you, it's even difficult to get a hold on the nucleus and or there is a small pcr which has occurred and then subsequently i place the lens so as to push back the uh, posterior capsule and then go ahead and do the rest of the cortex and removal of the nucleus but in this situation it was a, a difficult case the pupil was also coming down but uh, I would have just gone ahead and done a conventional phaco emulsification and uh, uh, put the lens at the end of the surgery. But it seemed to have worked very, very quite well in Nivian's hands. And of course, uh, 
because you are having a lens in the back, the anterior chamber depth is going to be further compromised and some of the events might happen closer to the endothelium and that might be a price to pay. That's why in heart grown cataracts, I am um, not sure whether it's a good idea to do this. Paneer? Uh, I would have done, uh, if the problem is there, small nucleus, I would have done a supracapsular uh, fake emulsification under cover of the viscoelastic rather than putting an IOL in the bag and then attempting fake I have not done that. You have not done that. Me too. I think it was a fairly bulky cataract. So, uh, from the very beginning, the pupil was uh, uh, mid-dilated. So, I would have first of all used some iris, uh, you know, um, expansive uh, device. And um, again, I don't think uh, uh, putting the lens was really required. Because uh, I think if he had a good visualization, he would have been much more confident in uh, doing his chopping and uh, putting the lens after. Because the pupil was small, I think he was uh, more apprehensive about the posterior capsule and put in the lens first. So I think a proper visualization is important. Using a pupil expansive device would have, I think, eased his surgery. Yeah, I think it's a very good point, Ritu. Is, uh, I, I would also put a iris hook or a, or a mali you can drink or whatever it is. Sujata, anything different? <coughs> I mean, I agree with all of you. I mean, I would have definitely used <coughs> um, uh, iris hooks at least. And also the other thing that I have uh, objection to is that the way you're injecting the lens is almost like a blind technique because we really don't know where the, uh, fortunately for you, it slipped into the bag. But such a large lens, if it is outside, if it's in the sulcus, then it will be difficult to implant it post uh, removal of cataract. That is one thing which bothers me. The second thing that bothers me is doing an anterior chamber phaco. You were doing completely an anterior chamber phaco so there's definitely likely to be compromise of the endothelium with such hard cataracts. So just using iris hooks will give you better visibility and you could have done the whole thing in the bag and then implanted the lens. So that is my take on this. And the initial corneal edema also indicates that, uh, which you had for the first few days, indicates that some amount of endothelial compromise has been there in this patient. Yeah, okay. Um, uh... I will just. Uh, uh, Bon, can I just make a point? Uh, yes, yes, Ramurthy. I just want uh, to show one small thing about the Hoya. They wanted to show me about the Nanex lens. So after you are this thing, I will do it. No, I would, uh, as far as the uh, iris hooks, yes, you have to use where required. But I would have done what uh, Nivian did because, you know, I always differentiate between a small rexis phaco emulsification and a small pupil phaco emulsification. And, you know, when he was doing the rexis, he had a fairly good exposure and I think he got the rexis, the size that he wanted about 4.5 millimeters. Even if the pupil comes down after that with a reasonably good competence in phaco surgery, as he did, you can manage this uh, uh, cataracts without the need for uh, iris hooks, especially when there's an uncomplicated surgery uh, like uh, what he showed. So once I have a good rexis size, about 4.5 millimeters or more, then my resorting to... Uh, uh, it is looks so any pupil expansion device is extremely low. Yeah, I always ask Nivian this question. Why don't we expose the tip much more? More burying inside. Especially, especially when you are dealing with harder cataracts. Because I want that tip to go into the uh, nucleus very nicely. Because if you have a sleeve there, that is going to prevent that tip from going into that. Because your sleeve is almost, I'm not able to see the tip at all. What tip are you using? I think that was an easy tip, sir. The slightly flat. Yeah, but anyway, I, you know, every time, every webinar, I ask that question to you. Next time, I'll, so more exposure. Anyway, I'm going to quickly good. share the uh, the Hoya guys. Uh, uh, the uh, just I'll take only one minute of your time. The Nanex magic. I don't know how many people are you are you able to see my screen. You able to see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. yes. This Hoya preloaded uh, I will port portfolio has come out with a lot of uh, fantastic preloaded uh, lenses. The ISERT, the Nan Nanex, the, the latest one is the uh, Nanex, the VVNX, as you know. Uh, the, this, uh, the lenses have got the ozone uh, coating on the posterior surface, which makes it very, very uh, uh, PC friendly, as well as the incidence of PC was also very less. And also the incidence of negative dysphotopsia because of the uh, uh, Glazed haptic also is very good, very good. Look. One of the best, um, uh, what do you call the systems of the injector systems you can see here. Uh, the, the, 
the both the screwing type as well as the pushing type is also there available with this uh, uh, hoya technique a 100% success rate and i'm just showing this quick uh, video of how this uh, uh, thing there are three parts in this uh, in the system is probably one of the best systems i ever used the lens is also very crystal clear it's a colorless lens and uh, it's a beautiful lens the nanex if people how many people are using nanex lenses in this uh, in this uh, panel anybody using i, I have used these lenses more yeah uh, i'm using three, the same, sir. Yeah. three parts to the uh, injector system the part 1 part 2 and part 3 and this is the part 3 which i'm using which, which i'm detaching now and then you can see that uh, you can have either the screwing type or the push type the control is better it goes through without any distortion of 1.8 mm it's probably one of the best lenses uh, i've seen the best uh, uh, loading system you can ever see and uh, thank you very much uh, hoya for this uh, sponsoring the next three uh, webinars of the connect series and uh, i sincerely thank all the panelists here i request our managing committee member dr atik to give the uh, formal vote of thanks <clears throat> a heartfelt thanks on behalf of uh, the managing committee of uh, tnoa it was a wonderful session though we had uh, overshot by about uh, 45 minutes there was a lot of learnings from each and every uh, uh, talk i personally felt it was a great uh, uh, sunday afternoon uh, listening to all uh, the speakers and it was a, a varied uh, a presentation by all the speakers there was no repetition each talk had lot of uh, significance and uh, heartfelt thanks to uh, hoya ramurthy sir panir selvam sir uh, anaga madam all the panelists and uh, all the speakers for uh, spending your sunday uh, morning which dragged on till afternoon thank you so much and thanks to numero, uh, numero tech tech. for organizing this okay we'll catch up again stay tuned for more tnoa activities we have the walk the talk with none other than dr r v ramani the founder of the shankara group of institutions on 5th february 8 pm ist see you guys thank, thank you sir thank you thank you thank you madam talk by all of you excellent excellent superb each each video was just fabulous yeah yeah very good good and all the panelists thank you very much for that thank you so much thank you well email past president thank you sir thank you very much thank you well all the best dr mohan thank you thank, thank you thank you to you thank you i need all your blessings yes definitely super